All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is July 19th, 2024. I wasn't sure I was going to make it today. Uh, I had some dental issues, but the dentist was able to, to patch it up so I can get this done today. And uh, hopefully we'll be good in the remaining. Oh, let's see how much time we got left. 23 days and change. If we have understood it as we believe we have, as has been evidenced in all of the revelations, and especially the last full teaching we did here. Of course, we did the live in the last one, but this one right here, man, that was that was the cherry on top, the final piece that, not the final piece to understand it, but it was the final piece of something that we, we hadn't yet figured in its place uh, based on the sun, and now we've got it. Well, brothers and sisters, we're going to have some fun tonight. A lot of this, what you're going to see tonight, is going to be very similar to the complete seven churches revelation that we did. And what I mean by that is it's not going to be the seven churches again, um, but it's going to be this time about the discourses. So what I'm going to do is because just like the seven churches, we had understood them for several years now in relation to how they play out in the end of days, but there's been so much lately that has been added to the revelation, more parts and more pieces that we were able to put in and so I did a, a complete one now. Well, that's what we're going to do tonight with the discourses. Now, all of this virtually is, I mean, it's generally from memory anyways. But the, uh, uh, um, the what is it, Bible Gateway that I use has been glitching all day, even right up to now. So I don't have all of the tabs that I would normally go to to remind myself. Not that I generally always go to them anyways, but sometimes there'll be little helpful reminders. Uh, this time, I I have a few of them opened, but they they go blank or they trying to reload and there's glitches. So it doesn't really change anything for us. We're going to go through it. We're going to go chapter by chapter, Luke, Mark, and Matthew. And what I'm going to try to do this time is not only be very detailed about it, as we generally always are, but now with all of the additional insight that we can add into it, what we're also what I'm also going to do is I'm going to stick from Luke's discourse first, then we're going to go to Mark's, and then we're going to go to Matthew's. And I'm not going to jump around. I'm going to do my best not to jump from going to Luke and Matthew, Matthew, sorry, Luke to Mark, and then go back to Luke's, and then go to Mark's, and then go to Matthew's, and show you a couple things, and then go. I'm going to try to just stick with Luke's, then to Mark's, then to Matthew's, and we're going to see these differences. We're going to see these things play out that we've revealed before and we're going to add all these new insights these new revelations that have come and we're going to break it all down and we'll show it to you even in the timeline of the calendar now again i will say it with a with a with a i don't know if the word caution is right but when we go to the year counts I do believe it's obviously going to be the years. However, the exact date may vary because there's incredible events that happen, especially towards the end of the sixth year of seal, that may actually alter the earth a bit. So the the days, whether they speed up or slow down or however that might work, there might be some change there. But based on what we know on the calendars, the way they are, this is what we're going to be seeing. This will be the time frame of these things that uh, we're talking about. And if you're new to the ministry, you will have heard me say things um, or you're going to hear me say things like a period of time called 14 years and a portion called above. This above is a period of days called is is a period of 50 days. And you're going to say, what on earth is this guy talking about? Everybody knows the tribulation is seven years. Well, we can prove to you that everybody has only seen about half of the tribulation. Oh, sure, they've seen the seals and the trumpets and everything, but they've mixed it all together. And the other thing you're going to hear is, as you've just heard me speak about Luke and then Mark and then Matthew. And the answer and the reason for that is the scriptures tell us the first will be last, the last will be first. And we revealed here over se almost seven years that these differences in the Gospels are the revelation of the end of days. They represent three different groups of people from the Gentile bride in Luke going pre-trib, the, the world, the, the house of Israel, and the Gentiles grafted in that are going to be the mid-trib great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. 
and Matthew's gospel, which is to the house of Judah at the return of the Lord feet down on the Mount of Olives at the seventh year of trumpets, which is the 14th year. And you're going to see this. It's all laid out. It's in Scripture. We'll touch on some of these points. But throughout the discourses, as we go through them, you're going to understand it, if you, especially if you're newer to the ministry and you've never seen it yet, all laid out in order. It's really, really going to blow your mind. But before you go down that trail with us tonight, which you're, you're glad to just go ahead and do it, I always recommend everybody come to this playlist. If you haven't watched the first four videos of this intro series or gone to ministryrevealed.com and go to the intro page in the playlist, then you're not fully going to grasp what's been revealed and what's going on. You're going to be coming in from, from a, a, an understanding that's confused in seven years, always going to Matthew, not realizing who Mark and who Luke are speaking to in the Synoptic Gospels. These intros... Just there's 12 videos in here, but if you watch the first four, you will begin to understand what it is, excuse me, what it is that's been happening here in the revelation of what we call the open books. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the is to come of the end of days. And it's 50 days followed by 14 years. And then the final 15th year is the Jubilee and the beginning of the millennial reign. So in the first video, it's only a 22-minute video. It introduces you to the next to the things that you're going to begin to understand more in the following three. The second video is a 30-minute intro with a study note that you can follow along and print off if you'd like to make notes on, where you're going to begin to see the differences in the Gospels. One I always talk about is in Luke's Gospel, before Jesus went to the cross, he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means in the Strong's Concordance, in the Greek, it means gorgeous, it means beautiful, white, radiant, like a bride would wear. When you go to Mark's Gospel, Jesus was arrayed in purple. When you go to Matthew's Gospel, he was arrayed in scarlet. And when you understand that there is no white bridal gown in tribulation, but there is purple and scarlet, just like the woman riding the beast where, who is arrayed in purple and scarlet, you see that Mark and Matthew are a portion for tribulation. So you don't know how far into tribulation until you understand more of what's spoken about within their Gospels, like the discourses tonight, and connecting it to the book of Revelation and other areas. So those are the types of things that you'll begin to understand that there are absolutely... Now, here's what you have to understand as well. Everything is was, is, and is to come. So was is from creation to Christ. Is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib. And the is to come is, of course, from the pre-trib to, to the end of the end of days. So when we see scriptures and, and we read them in our everyday, the way people would normally read them in church and so forth, it's the application of them to life and so forth and the events that took place in the is. But the differences within the Gospels themselves are revealing a mystery that tell us about the end of days. And when you understand this difference in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, you will realize why everybody has seen and stands on different positions, whether pre, mid, or post, are true. And it is the revelation of the Gospels themselves that reveal that pre, mid, and post are all true true it starts with a pre-trib at the 50 days <coughs> excuse me at the beginning of the 50 days followed by seven years of seals and in that seventh year of seals that is the great multitude rapture of revelation 7 and then at the beginning at the sound of the seventh trumpet the mystery is over like revelation 10 says and that is the lord returning like lightning from one end unto the other feet down on the mount of olives for which Matthew's gospel then says, as we're going to get into, Matthew's gospel then says in his discourse, it would be as the days of Noah. You don't see it in Luke's, you don't see it in Mark's, you only see it in Matthew's. And the timing is absolutely perfect and very relevant. Not just as we've been told by, by prophecy teachers that, oh, the days of Noah, it's because we're in the days of Noah. Nope. When prophecy is talking about the days of Noah, it's talking about the literal craziness of the days of Noah. 
and we have not seen anything like that in hundreds of lifetimes, as many lifetimes as you want to talk about since the days of Noah. And you'll understand this as we get to that point towards the end of the video. The next video in the intro series, the third one, is the revelation of the 14 years in the portion called above. It's also just a 30-minute Bible study to help you understand where these things are shown, and it's only the introduction to it. The fourth video, the fourth video is a big one. That fourth video is about two hours and 45 minutes, and it's called It's All Because of Matthew. And it's hugely important because as you begin to understand these things, you're going to say, how on earth was all of this missed? One, it wasn't yet the time for the Lord to reveal it till the, till the final generation. And two, it's because everybody from seminaries to scholars to everybody they founded their understanding in the Gospel of Matthew because they looked to Mark and they looked to Luke as just more insights, more pieces of the puzzle of things that took place in the is. So they focus on Matthew and they go a little bit to Mark and even less to Luke to fill in some of the blanks of Matthew. So they're looking through the eyes of the is. And nobody had understood or realized because of these differences and speaking to different groups in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, that by looking through the lens of Matthew's gospel all the time, not being aware of it, everything they would see in Scripture was associated with only seven years. That's why they only see seven years. Because they're looking through the lens and an understanding of Matthew's gospel no matter where they look throughout Scripture, and especially in this case, prophecy. That's what has caused it. Once you realize the differences in the Gospels, you realize the above in the 14 years, you realize that it's not just the story of the end of days, it's the story of the entirety of creation. It is wild. It is a crazy trip as you really get deep into it. But the first four videos here is definitely, definitely where you want to start. Once we get going for a little further in tonight, I'm going to talk about something that I touched on in this one, but when I spoke in this one, it was it was this AI trend and the years that they were talking about and, and where it was going and what they planned on doing and how it would change life, and they believe man through AI would bring about this utopia. Well, when you, when you see things like that and you, you, you really track them in what they're saying, it sounds like it's the end of days, and it's because it will be the end of days. However, they think through men and through machine, they're going to come out on the other side and it's going to be a utopia ruling and reigning over all these things themselves. Well, we know that's not the case. Well, in this, I also spoke about a book that I've shared a number of times called The Fourth Turning. And I just saw an interview on this YouTube channel I watch sometimes with one of the guys, one of the, there were two authors for The Fourth Turning book. Uh, written in 1997, and one of the authors died, I think it was about 11 years ago. But they had this other the other author on in this uh, podcast, and we're going to go through clips of it to, again, show you not this type of thing that was showing us that what we teach in relation to Revelation, but I'm going to show it to you based on the studies of these things over hundreds and hundreds of years showing these cycles of first turning, second, third, and then fourth turning, and what takes place in a fourth turning every single time. But also, what comes out on the other side after every fourth turning? It is absolutely wild, and it's the same type of thing as this. Not, not the AI side, not, but, but what this is going to bring about and how it plays out within it is going to be the same thing you're going to witness within the cycles of these things that take place. And then what does you're going to hear what he talks about towards the end. I'm just going to go through a few clips because it's not tonight's focus, but I really wanted to share it because it ties in. Because once that fourth turning is over, even what happens in a fourth turning, and then what comes out after a fourth turning, when you hear the words that he says, it is so wild because he is literally speaking the exact same thing 
as this of what would happen after about 14, 15 years from now. They're all saying the same time frame. Give or take 15 years. Over and over and over again. Exactly as we've been teaching in the revelation of prophecy in the open books that have been revealed. It's so wild. Now, let me show you this. This is a good one. Watch this. Uh, da -da -da, where'd I want to go? I wanted to show you this picture. There you go. So I'm actually in this box right now. I'm sitting here in my chair behind this wall talking to you guys right now. This is, you know, some would say my little tabernacle. It's, it's my little shed that I built in my garage to keep from the cold in the winter. And uh, that's for my heating in the winter. I've got a little Mr. Buddy that I put there in the winter. However, the reason I'm sharing this is this right here. We had a, a brother that had sent me a letter and reached out to me who lives in the same city as me finally. <clears throat> so I reached out to him. We spoke on the phone. Hopefully we'll hook up. And um, he had an idea about printing these really big. And this is the detailed tribulation timeline chart. And it's not the one with all of the scripture connections below. It's just the chart itself. And he had told me he had watched a 1977 movie that he really liked. And I think it was, it was a prophecy, like an end time one or something like that. And he spoke about this chart and, and this timeline that was laid out on it that they had come across. Something along those lines. And he said it would be great to have one like a six by four or something. And so I thought, hey, that's a great idea. You know, you got to watch this teaching on the detailed tribulation timeline that we just did, uh, you know, maybe a couple months ago. And it has this great chart that our sister Tammy put together. And then we reviewed together. And so I thought, you know what? This is a great idea. I'll go get two of them printed. And so this is actually about five and a half feet by 20, uh, five and a half feet by two feet. So it's it's a big boy and what a perfect place my my son and my daughter as well They thought it was absolutely perfect. You can see it. It's big letters. It's clear. It's detailed and uh, Just so you guys know I'm gonna the link if I forget the link will should be in the description box If it's not there you can always ask for the link and then you send it to your printer You say you want it about two feet by about five and a half feet whatever would be a good fit and, and depending on the size that you want, you can make it smaller or bigger, whatever you'd like. And uh, talk about a great leave behind. Because behind this and on the shelves that I have over here, as you can see, there's toilet paper, there's food, there's water, there's, there's bins with uh, USBs uh, of some teachings. There's printouts, there's the Ministry Revealed book, there's uh, 19 Bibles in them. Um, all sorts of things as well as water and all sorts of stuff back there. Now, am I, did I do all of this for me? No, I'm doing it for, you know, all of my neighbors that hear me when I do my teachings every five days going into late into the night sometimes, uh, and getting excited and the garage doors just cracked open a little bit, you know, they're, they're definitely hearing. So it's for neighbors and, and for others who will come in the time of the end. Talk about a great visual for people to have. So I thought I would share that. Uh, in Canada, you know, I got two of them done. They did it in one day. I was so excited. It was like one day turnaround. They were 60 bucks each. <clears throat> I had two of them done because I did one for our brother Brad. That's why I'm hoping he'll get back in touch with me here so I can bring one to him. And uh, I just thought it was a great idea. So I wanted to share that with you guys. And I wanted to show you. Here it is right here. So we've shared on this. We've got the video on it, right? The de detailed tribulation timeline. This is it right here, just so you guys are aware. All right? So, with that, let's get started with this uh, fourth turning video clip. There, there's a few clips, a, f um, a few minutes, and then just a, a little bit here and there. But I really want you to pay attention. Some of it might be hard to grasp if you've never read the book or, or studied anything on this. It might be hard to understand, but I'll stop at kind of some of the key points. I, we didn't need to go into the details of every single turning, but there are portions of turning that are significant to understand. And what it is, it's, it's over periods of several hundred years, these cycles of four that progressively get bigger and worse. And what always happens in a fourth turning and what takes place in the midst of it spiritually 
and what comes out on the other side after a fourth turning. It's really, really very interesting. So we're going to watch the first, uh, you know, eight, nine minutes of this one, and then we'll go to a few minutes further in and so forth. <clears throat> Hopefully not too many commercials. Maximum individualism. These are historically, oh. these are... I definitely need to slow that down for you guys. <laughs> a lot of these I'll watch on double speed, but we'll put it at one and a quarter. So if you're listening on this on faster speed, you can slow it down a little bit if you need to. These often feature wild market uh, 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 euphorias, um, you know, like in the 1990s, the dot-com bubble, I think, has gone down in history. This is also the 20s. You think about the famous decades in third turnings in American history. You're talking about decades of cynicism, bad manners, and weak, very weak civic instincts. I'm thinking about the 1990s, the 1920s, the 17, uh, excuse me, the 1850s, the 1760s. These are wild decades where we didn't think we had any kind of civic core in America. And I would say the, the book which gave the best sense of direction of the 1990s was written by Francis Fukuyama. Uh, it was called The End of History. And you read that book and it's all the big institutions are gonna fade away all the authoritarians and dictators were going to collapse, right? And there'd just be individuals transacting with each other on the internet. You'd go into a Starbucks, get out your laptop, and just transact with people around the world, and all your million and one wants would be satisfied. No sense of community in that vision at all, right? That's where we were. But history says the third turning is always followed by the fourth turning. And the fourth turning is that process. It's dark, it's violent usually, but it's where we refine community. And I think one thing that's, that's fascinating, and in this latest book I wrote uh, last year, The Fourth Turning is Here, is, I, is I, I look at how familiar we are in knowing how a society goes from community individualism, because in our own human lifetimes, we've all lived it, right? But clearly, there's got to be another direction history often goes, right? It's got to go from individualism to community. None of us have... And so what he's talking about there is this individualism to community... You know, in, in, our, in most of our lifetimes of, of those who are here, we've never experienced this, the, the, the wars, right? Like the World War II and so forth. And it, to that scale, where, where everything changes after, where, where you're going to go from, you know, what they were like in the roaring 20s and getting skimpy in, in their attire and being real freewheeling and individual being a third turning. Then you get to the fourth turning and you have World War II, uh, World War II and everything that came out of that. <clears throat> you then see people a lot more conservative. It becomes a lot more com community. More things are built and they're working together. That's what comes out of it. And there's, there's a greater leadership. And so we're right now, well, we were in a third turning and we kind of still are. He says, you know, the fourth turning is here, as you can see there. But the, the real crux of the fourth turning is really still at hand because we're still, as he would say, in this individual state right now. Everybody is very individual people. It's about me. It's about I'm this number of letters and and I'm this and I'm that it's 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 a lot more about the individual because of this cycle. It, it's a cycle of human nature that continues and continues to replay. And we're at the tail end start tail end of the three and start of the fourth turning. The fourth turning, he would say, I think officially started, give or take, around 2008 with the financial crisis. But it's, it's still like this overlap with the third until it really kicks off. And so that's, that's what he's talking about here. This individualism that through the fourth turning will bring about community. Have any familiarity with that? Because it's beyond our lifetime, right? Ah, that was the last fourth turning. But hardly anyone is, you know... Uh, almost everyone who lived through that is too old to tell us about it. But that's what I want to focus on. Because we are now in the fourth turning, and it's most climactic moments. We have about a decade to go. It's the most climactic moments are ahead of us. So, so you got high first turning, awakening, unraveling, crisis, which is the one we're in right it's now. It's the fourth turning. The yeah. fourth turning. It's kind of like seasons. Think of spring, and summer. Do, and the way you have them is you have, yeah, I, I saw how, I think Tony did it the right way, the way he broke it down when you and him sat down together. He broke it down by seasons, which yeah. was an easy way to see it. So high, you got World War II, 
lasted till mid 60s. You got 1946 to 64, which is the you know 18 years that boomers produced 76 million kids, most ever in an 18 year period. Soldiers coming back from war, boom, bunch of babies are born, and then you got the Mustang. You can even predict what businesses could do if you can get this right. Then the last event of the high was JFK assassination. That's the last event. I think that's what you yeah. refer to. Then two awakening. That's 64 to 84. Three unraveling. That's 84 to 2008 ish. This is yeah. the weakening of institutions and the rise of uh, individualism. And then a uh, crisis is now 2008 till about the you said late 20s, 2028, early, early, early 30s, early 2030s. Yeah, we right. think now about about 2032, 2033, it will be resolved. That will be the resolution. That'll be like 1946 when we're founding. Everything is in concrete, right? Well, Bretton Woods, each. UN, all that. And so remember, he it's it's not exact time frames, right? It's within. So right now he's saying 10 or so years. But he also talks later, you know, this 5, 10, even 15-year period. Each of these that have happened in the past, when you break it down, a lot of these have to do with, a, 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 you know, the, a war. It leads to a war. Are, is one of your predictions, you said there, there could be a global pandemic. There was one when you guys said there could be a global pandemic. Financial challenges, we experienced it. Do you also foresee or predict that a World War III could happen the next 5 to 10 years? Well, it could happen any year. Could I mean, happen in almost 30 days. Yeah. <laughs> 1960, 1962, as I recall. Look, um, uh, let's take war first, and then I'll, then I'll move on to your other, your other thing. Um, in the most recent book, I think in Fourth Turning, we went back. So we deal with sort of the Anglo-American saculum. So, you know, we go back even before in America. And we go back, or most recently, we go back to the War of the Roses, the Armada. You know, we go, this pattern is, you know, five or six seculum long now, right? It characterizes the modern world, you know, sort of post-Renaissance, post-Reformation in the modern world. And it's becoming increasingly global. And I, and I hope we come back to that because we see now these trends happening globally, right? This trend back toward community, authority, ethnocentrism. My God, Patrick, it's around the world. Name a place in the world where you don't see it. Mm -hmm. we've, got, we've got the French elections yesterday. Mm -hmm. That's we, we, I saw that. we've, got, we've got India, we've got Pakistan, we've got... China, we got Philippines, we got Argentina. You got Argentina. Look, this, this is these are becoming. So we, I want to return to how this became a global, you know, how this became global. World War II and the Great Depression were global events, after all, and so you can sure. see global yeah. echoes, generational echoes from that. Now listen to this. But I want to now deal with this thing going back that far to the you know 15th, 16th century. At least in our history, every total war has happened in a fourth turning, and every fourth turning has had a total war, right? Every. Every. That's a, that Yikes, right? But it's, it's not a mystery for us, is it? We've understood this. And this is what he's talking about. In this 10, 15 year period that remains, he knows the, the crux of this fourth turning, when it really, really takes effect, is a world war. This is what he was saying. He, he likes to say, you know, he doesn't like to say there is a world war. And he would go on to ask him, you know, is, is the world, is it going to be a world war? And he's like, well, I'm not going to say world war. But in his book, he talks about World War. You know, we shared it in his book, you know, these clips, this clip here from his book from 1987. And they know it from even the decades of the 20s. So they had 2020 into 2025. You see, they know that within 2020 to 2025, especially, is that is that period of that cycle turning and war breaks out. He even goes on to describe it down here. He says, you know, the decades of the 20s, the dates are suggestive. Even if the crisis need not be as terrible as these images of Armageddon imply. Okay? So he's saying that in his description of all this, it could very well be like an Armageddon. Right? Because every single fourth turning in all of history has been war. And so now they talk about civil war or global war. And he's talking about how in every turning is an all-out war. And though he doesn't want to say it on, on a big broadcast like, uh, like the one he's on, he talks about it in his books. And of course it's going to be global because the world is so connected now. Everything is on a global scale, and it went all the way back even to World War II. So of course that's what he understands and knows is coming. He just doesn't want to flat out say it here. And the timing is right in line with the other video that we did in relation to these things with AI and what those groups of people are saying. So you've got the, the futurists of, this, of these trends that are taking place now and 
you've got the historians through through cycles of history over hundreds of years all telling us the same thing that scripture is revealed crazy wild stuff that's a okay. prediction but well, it's not a prediction it's a correlation it's an association look I want to be as optimistic as possible. I don't say in the book that it requires it, but I am saying, and I, I go through a lot of sociology here yeah. about how, how do you incubate community? And I, 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 look, I, throw, I went through all the sociology. I mean, I went back to Weber. Okay, this is, this is also very important. How do we go from individualism like it is now and has been since the 90s and how even that, that other guy, the, the Japanese guy's book, and this individual and everybody doing things online and, you know, and every, you know, youngsters being depressed and being so disconnected from people for the most part. How do you how do you go away from that to turning it all back to community? And this is what he's talking about in in everything he studied. It never happens because people suddenly agree and and change their views, their their strongly held views and then suddenly go to that other person's side. It doesn't happen. And they have a big conversation about this. It never happens without a great war. Durkheim, Tunney's, all of them, they all agree. Community springs out of conflict, right? I mean, that's what creates. That's what brings people together in community. 9-11 right. brought us together, right? Let's go fight and, and the enemy. Lot, you know, right? it's interesting when people talk about, well, Neil, you know, we could never have trust in institutions again. We could never trust a leader again. And I said, do you know what G.W. Bush's ratings were four months after 9-11? 81%? What's that? Over 90. Over 90%. It was like 93%. Yeah. Uh -huh. Don't tell me you can't bring trust. It's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be a trust. You wake up one sunny day and say, oh, you know, I think I want to trust someone today. That is not how trust is born. People don't understand how history works, Patrick. It doesn't work because it goes in the way you want it to go. These things happen and they force us to do things even that we don't like. And I hope we get back to that because I think that's an interesting point about, you know, how community works and how history works. It doesn't take us necessarily where we want to go, but it often takes us where we have to go. So, so, so can there be a fourth turning without a war? You're not saying yes or no. Here's what I'm saying. It does require total urgency. It requires an emergency. It requires adrenaline, Patrick. It requires people to say, you know what? If we don't form a community, we're history. We're, I mean, you know, in the, in the, in the. And see, and, and Patrick that David is trying to get him to say it because, but he doesn't want to say it on his broadcast because it's big. But Patrick Bet David is a very optimistic guy. He's a he's a strong Christian too, by the way, and he he's very optimistic in in trying to help people and 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 get them you know more prosperity, not in a prosperity gospel way, but he he's trying to help people, and so he's always looking at things from from you know the the lighter side that you know if we can avoid this right but prophetically this isn't going to be avoided it's absolutely just as this guy is talking about is this is what's coming and he understands this so now we're going to continue on from here for another six minutes as a parent nothing is more important than making sure your children's needs are looked after Everyone thought that the liberal middle was gone. I mean, capitalism was over. It was either fascism or communism. That was the future. And there's incredibly polarized. We had, we had labor riots. We had sit-down strikes. We had the Pinkertons out. It was a charged environment. And we were still mired in the Great Depression. You know, by 1938, 1939, still a double-digit unemployment. If you had asked Americans at that time, you say, we're going to have a huge conflict in America in a couple of years. What do you think it's going to be about? They probably would have said internal. It's going to be, I don't know, it's going to be the... It's going to be the, the right wing against the left wing, you know, in America. No one would have said, oh, we're going to have a global conflict against fascism, which is when in fact happened. So one of the things I like to do is kind of do an anatomy of these fourth turnings and to try to discern what kind of trajectories they take. But one thing you see within these fourth turnings is this growth of tribalism, right? This is how, what happens in a fourth, remember how we enter, we go from an unraveling into the, into the crisis. And, and what is it people are overwhelmed by is the sense that everyone feels alone. You remember, we triumphed individualism for so long. We all feel alone. I talk to millennials today all the time. I talk particularly to late wave millennials in their 20s. 
And the one thing I get response most of all is isolation, disconnection, a sense of complete aloneness. They don't have communities. They try to have, you know, uh, ersatz communities, you know, through social media, which obviously just makes them even more miserable, as you know. Have you read Silent Generation yet or not yet? Uh, Anxious Generation. Anxious Generation, yeah. yeah. The, yeah he's a, a great yeah. book and a great writer. Jonathan Hyde. You know, Jonathan Hyde. Phenomenal book. Yeah, yeah. and a phenomenal yeah. writer, a phenomenal thinker. Yeah. Um, and in fact, our portrait of this generation is very much, I mean, we kind of go through the different generations in the most recent book. And my, my portrait, I think, is reasonably um, uh, overprotected and anxious, right? Uh, that's exactly the artist archetype. Remember, we talked about mm -hmm. it. It all goes mm -hmm. back to archetype. Yeah. So, but but you're, you're, you're. I'm asking you about morals and values. Okay, morals and values. I want to know which one of these phases, turnings that we go through, where where man leaders, fathers, husbands, presidents, police officers, local, you know, people say it's okay. Let them do whatever they want to do. You know, we can. You're saying this happens regularly. I believe it. City of Corinth, where hey, you know, look at all the stuff that they're doing. But then now it's as if if you don't accept this as the norm for values and principles, you're the problem. So what happens by the end of the fourth turning is that one authority is in charge, right? Listen to me. Uh, so authority is enforced and the morals and values become conventional again. Always happens. Always happens. You hear that? Just that alone. Let's go for a few more seconds. You look at how people dressed by the end of World War II as opposed to how they were dressed going into the you know, late 20s, mm -hmm. going into mm -hmm. the 30s. You look at how America became, after the Civil War, kind of your Victorian image of respectability. We all become more conventional. Uh, by the end of the fourth turning. I'll you see that? Did you hear what he said? When, when we come out of the fourth turning, we come out of it, every, there's more, it's conventional for the people. There is one leader, there's, there's one leader and things are more conventional, more traditional, and all of that, 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 what we would call even now that we're seeing in people and the way they dress and the individualism and all of that, all of that goes away because of what this war and this battle then brings out on the other side. So it's just like we were talking about in relation to the AI and what they're planning on doing and what they're hoping it would do when it comes out on the other side that they have created this utopia with AI. History is showing the same thing and he's talking about the same thing that when it comes out on the other side, it's not so much in this case utopia, but it goes back to a civility and people getting along and community and working together and one leader and one set of values, one set of principles over it all. Who do you think that is? Do you, do you think it's this time? Do you think it's going to be just these continuous cycles of this until the rest of eternity? That's what the outside world would think. That's what they might think if they study stuff like this. This is falling right in line with what the Lord has shown us in the revelation of his scriptures. That when it comes out from this fourth turning, that, that's literally on our doorstep. Yes, it started, but you can see if he's still talking about people and individualism and, and it's still in that third, even though he's claiming it's the fourth, it still has most of the third in it. It's not until the war and everything breaks out that they're forced to change and to come together more and to, you see, this, this, it's all directly in line. And when it's over, a leader emerges, a set of values, a set of principles are put out and they come more into community and conservative. Wild. Always. And I talk about that in the book. So that's the answer to that question, because along with community, it's conventionality that supports community. Think about the, the American high. Very community oriented, very conventional culture. The two things buttress each other, right? So if you're looking forward to that kind of morality, things aren't said, things are, are said, are supportive of conventional norms, uh, you have something to look forward to. Uh, He's telling me you got something to look forward to, but not for the next 10 to 15 years. He's telling me you got something to look forward to you know, once it comes to an end and it returns to that, well, he would be happy with that, right? Because as a Christian with us, uh, you know, he doesn't, I don't know if he believes pre, mid or post or any of those things, but um, that's what he's looking for is this, the, the morality of the Lord and all that connected in the end, coming back to conservative value. The next five, 10, 15 years, because that's where we're moving. There you right? go, you heard him But it moves five, 10, in that years. direction under the brunt of, uh, of 
urgency and conflict and hmm. national mobilization. Yeah. But that's but that it all goes together. And that's what I try to bring out. Here's what you're going to get by the end of the fourth turning. You're going to get um, much greater community, one community, not different tribes, which we have today. <laughs> one community, not a bunch of different tribes, one community. Hello. You're going to get greater equality. That always happens. And by the way, Hello. we can talk a little bit about economically how we're going to achieve equality because some way it's going to be, you know, ripping off rich people. Inflation, number one. Always an ingredient for turning. So we can talk about that. The next thing you get... your phone on this side. I think it's picking up some stuff. The, ne yeah. the next thing you're going to get is um, uh, authority, right? One person in charge and one <laughs> wow. set of norms in charge because that's what the new regime is going to be. The new regime is going to be very powerful. You're also going to get a renewed commitment to the long-term future. This is where we build our huge long-term infrastructure, huge new institutions. What we would call the millennial reign in Christ at the helm. Toward the very end of the crisis and at the very beginning of the, of the first turning, that's when we make our long-term investment. Totally unlike today where we're mortgaging our future. You know, we talked about that mm -hmm. earlier. Then finally, this movement from, um, from defiance in the culture to convention. So that's where we move. Um, and, and I play it out. Now, when you say conventional, you mean traditional? Is that yeah. kind of a good word? Well, to, convention. To it it? The Latin root of convention means calling everyone together. You know, it's kind of like everyone moving together <laughs> in one it. set of values which reinforce time-tested norms. In order for that to happen, there has to be a very, very high level of fear, right? And a high level of fear to commit because... I, if, think, you're, I think you're beginning to understand it now. So, I think so Patrick here... I think, I think in... <laughs> That's where I was almost going to end it with him, except we got a, two more minutes at the end. You see, what, listen to everything they just said. It's the end of tribulation. The Lord ruling conventional ways, the best ways of doing things. And what does Patrick Bed David end with when he says, yes, yeah, see, now you're getting it. What does it end with? A fear. There has to be a, a, a great fear in this at the end and in, and, and, and whoever is running this at the end, which will be the Lord. It will be the fear of the Lord, right? A, a healthy, good fear to do that which is right, even in the millennial reign or especially in the millennial reign, you see? So when we see these cycles, when you really, man, when you study this out and you read his book and you go through this, it's so fascinating because you can understand these, what's happening in culture. Is, is it planned? Is, is everything purposely planned that it would go out like this? I highly doubt that it's passed down to play out these cycles over hundreds and hundreds of years. Are people planning things and nefarious that last hundreds of years within these things? Oh, absolutely. But are, are they able to control the entire community, <coughs> excuse me, on a global scale to get people to go into these cycles? No. It's, it's historical cycles in human nature and how they continue to play out generation after generation. It's wild to see that it, it, it's followed to see that where we are is where we're supposed to be and how it's taking place. The technology didn't even matter. It just, it, it, it forced people into those things even more so. It's because every turning in every subsequent turning, in particular, the fourth one is far worse than the ones that were, that preceded it. What would be far worse than World War II? World War Three and the weapons we have now, the end of days and the revelation that when it's over, the Lord will reign and there will be fear of the Lord, conventionality and, and, and a proper attire and, and community, a set of principles and values. I mean, it's so awesome listening to this. It just, oh, I love it. It just blows my mind to see how this directly connects with what the tech side is saying, but in a different way. And how it all comes out when it's over with the truth being the revelation of Scripture and the Lord bringing about his revelation of the end. You see, why is the Lord bringing about the end of days? What's the purpose of the end of days? Does he just want to kill everybody? Of course not. We know the purpose. The entirety of this purpose It's is Robert Cochran, to... Dodge Deep Ram, and I'm retiring. <laughs> so we're having Rob's retirement inventory reduction. Congratulations, Save Rob. Thank you. What... So, so it's, he's not doing it because he wants to just kill everybody. It's because it's the end. It's, it's a merciful love to bring everybody in who is left that, that would cry out to him to come in.
That's that's the purpose. And if 9-11 was a little glimpse of that, <coughs> what do you think it will be when it's the end of days in World War III? You see? This one is the final turning. This is it. Listen to this now, two minutes on faith. What role does faith play in these four turnings? Any role faith in God plays? Huge. Huge. Where is our faith the highest? Where is it the lowest? Ah, it's not as simple as that. It's that our faith changes its quality as you move through. Meaning? Well, let me go back. You remember when I talked about the awakening? Yeah. So what's the big movement in the awakening? Not salvation by work, salvation by faith. This would have been the Reformation, all the big awakenings. Suddenly, let's cast off everything our father said. Let's cast off all these big institutions. Let's look into ourselves, right? Wasn't Billy Graham's movement called the Great Awakening? Oh, they, yeah, they all call themselves Great Awakening. You know, all of those movements. But, but, and, and. <clears throat> so did you hear what he just said there? Because of this whole individualism movement, and it all starts to turn in sel into self and self perspective and even in the faith. What did he just say? All of this big movement comes from that that turning, not the fourth one, but the prior, the, the, the second one before, I think the second turning. And what came about in that turning? Faith alone. Faith alone. How many times have we heard that preached in pulpits? How many times do people argue about whether it's faith without works that you don't need works? We've heard that for decades. We've heard it for decades. But do you think that's that that's the, the story that all you need is just faith? No. Right? There, there's a million kinds of works. It's that people don't classify it as works. Diligently seeking the Lord, once you have faith, you need faith first. And then what's works? Studying the Lord, diligently seeking him like Enoch, right? Had faith that he was God and then diligently sought him. Or having faith and, and helping the poor, you know, feeding the hungry, giving something to drink, right? There, there's, there's dozens and hundreds and probably even millions of things that could be done that would be a type of work. It's not just faith, and that's why it says faith without works is dead. But works without faith is nothing, you see? And, and we've talked about this in the past where you can... Be, I, I've said it, you know, like a like a, a sweet old lady and she's helping at a soup kitchen, but doesn't believe in Jesus Christ or believe in God at all. Does God recognize that work? No, it means nothing to him because she doesn't have faith. Now, is she saved because if, if someone is in faith and does works, is that what saves them, the works? No, the works are the reward. Well, what period in history? Do you think the greatest rewards are about to come? Oh, sure, there are rewards all throughout history. doesn't matter the cycle. For those that, that, that seek the Lord and love the Lord and go and share him with others, those are rewards. These are all rewards that are received in heaven, from the smallest to the greatest. But what time in all of history or in the is to come? What would be the most needed time of work? Tribulation? You think? You think maybe tribulation would be that greatest time of works-based faith? More than at any other time in human history? Of course! And what is the reward, at least for what we've understood for the remnant? Now, will other people receive rewards coming to Christ and then sharing him and doing all these things and helping people out in the midst of tribulation? Absolutely. But we know of a group of people that are reserved for the end, that are prepared, that will receive the understanding from the Lord and go out and serve him during the time of tribulation. And what's their reward? Well, because it's the greatest time of, of heartache and pain in the midst of revival and, and, and joy because of how many people are coming to the Lord in that time, in the midst of this chaos that he's talking about, what do they get for reward? They're going to be resurrected from the grave and sit with him in his throne as he sits in his father's with his. You see? Because why? That means it goes from what? From an inside, oh, faith alone type, type of mentality in this cycle that we're in. And in the fourth turning, guess what he says? By the way, he was um, 
you know, Billy Graham's, you know, high tide was during the 70s and 80s. Huge resurgence of evangelicalism, by the way, during the awakening. Yeah. So this is when the mainstream churches, you know, the, the Methodists and the Presbyterians and kind of mainstream Protestantism began to decline and evangelicalism and all the charismatic, you know, groups, the Pentecostals and everything began to rise. That came out of the awakening. So you see this, this movement toward interiority, toward individualism, toward looking inside yourself for validation. That's the direction religion always takes during the summer season, the awakening, the second turning. You got it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's interesting. So what happens in the fourth turning? That's when we begin to say that, well, faith to actually do anything, it's got to have works. It's got to build something. Oh, yeah. Something needs to win, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I think you get it now. Now, in many ways... There, so did you just see that? Where he just said, see, now I think you're getting it. And it was such a big deal in what he was talking about. And here he is. Now he's getting it, seeing that it went from faith and just faith alone that we've been taught by our parents and so forth, that when the fourth turning comes, it's going to be faith with works because what? Because somebody has to win. Who is going to win in all of this, guys? The Lord. The Lord. It's the works for the Lord Jesus Christ in this fourth and final turning that is victory in Christ. You see how awesome this is? It is so, so incredible. I had to share it with you guys. It's powerful. When, when you pay attention, when you dissect it, you listen carefully, and you, you, you track what he's talking about. Oh, my goodness. It is, it's beautiful. It's exciting. It's nerve wracking. It's it's a little bit of uh, you know all these all these things that we experience in the revelation of prophecy and knowing that the time is so near at hand, so near at hand. What what were we looking at? Like twenty three days and change. It's wild. Every single thing is pointing to the same story: tech, history, prophecy, harvests. Sun, moon, and stars, scripture, the history of scripture, every single thing that we have shared in these past several months, past year, are all pointing to the same thing. The time is at hand. Awesome, awesome stuff. All right, now let's start here with 2 Corinthians chapter 12 to go into the discourses. This is why I wanted to start with that is, is what that has and what that talks about is he's even saying that it's going to come with World War Three, even though he was saying he doesn't really want to say it. He said every single one came with a massive war that turned it about his book. We saw the clip where it says like Armageddon, you know, not that it necessarily needs to be Armageddon as it seems to portray. Yes, that's what's coming. The end of days is coming, and it is World War III once it officially really kicks off. So what do we know? How does this play out? What does Scripture tell us about it? And how can we show this playing out in the details of what will take place just by using the discourses and showing where these connections are in Scripture to the discourses? Because this is the prophetic time frame right here in what Paul was talking about within himself that took place it is the prophetic layer underneath that we're reading when we see this in second corinthians chapter 12 starting in verse 2 i knew a man in christ above 14 years ago so it is those who are in christ spirit filled like romans 1 connected to a period of time called above which we have revealed here for years is a period of time called of 50 days which means at the very beginning of the 50 days, those in Christ and spirit-filled are going where? Well, let's see what it says. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. This means like. So it's like the great multitude rapture, which is down here. It's like a rapture, but they're going to the third heaven. So anybody that says, oh, pre-trib doesn't exist, we can show it to you in Luke. We can show it to you here. We can show it in many, many different places as we have. This is the revelation of the pre-trib in Christ, bride of Christ, going to the third heaven above the 14 years. 
Then it says, I knew such a man, whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows how that he was caught up into paradise. This is the great multitude rapture of Revelation chapter 12, verse 5. The was caught up. So when people say, oh, there's no such word as rapture in the Bible. Yes, there is. It's the Greek word harpazo. Translate harpazo from Greek into English and you get the word rapture. This one's the first one. This is the great multitude was caught up. And they're the ones in the seventh year of seals that are going to paradise, which is the place prepared when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of the sixth seal to get them. We come down further. And we see Paul give another portion in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 14. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you. So he's a typology here in Christ in the first, second, and third times. The first one was a taking to the third heaven. The second one was a taking to paradise. And the third one is him coming to them and saying, I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. You see, they were laying it up. They were blinded for our sakes because it's the kids. It's all of this that comes in first, and then it'll be theirs again. You see, we've even shown this from this right here. This is from the Apocrypha, as you guys will remember. And this is from fragments that were found. This is called Fragment 5. And listen to what it says. It proves out 2 Corinthians chapter 12 as prophetic also words. <clears throat> so we see here, as the elders say, then those who are deemed worthy of an abode in heaven will go there. Others will enjoy the delights of paradise and others will possess the splendor of the city. For everywhere the Savior will be seen according as they will be worthy who see him but that there is this distinction between the habitation of those who produce a hundredfold and that those and that of those that produce 60 fold and that of those that produce 30 fold for the first will be taken into the heavens the second class will dwell in paradise and the last will inherit the city what on earth is that talking about first taking to the third heaven Second taking to paradise, great multitude rapture. And the third is him returning feet down on the Mount of Olives for which the Jews will then inherit their land and will inhabit the city in the millennial reign. It is awesome when you understand it. It is the absolute proof and evidence of pre, mid, and post. They are all true and they are revealed to us in the Gospels. Now, when it comes to the discourses, the discourses in the Luke, Mark, and Matthew, all three of them, P.S., do not talk about a mid-trib and post-trib taking of people or gathering of them. Maybe, maybe really you could say the Mark one doesn't. The only clear one is the pre-trib one that you find in Luke's. So now, what does, what does it mean to be in Christ, spirit-filled, like Romans tells us, right? So we just saw in 2 Corinthians that it said it was those in Christ compared to the second one going to paradise. It said kind of, sort of, such an one, right? Kind of like the first one, but not fully because those who are in Christ, spirit-filled, are the ones that are going pre-trib. So what does Scripture tell us about what that means? Well, if you go to Luke 21, and we'll start in verse 34 and go to 36, it says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. Well, what should you be like? What should you be watching for? What should you be paying attention and not be caught up in? The, the cares of this life? Because it'll come as a snare, right? For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Everybody not taken pre-trib will be caught off guard. Watch. So now what should you actively be doing? 
not being caught up in the cares of this world and in the drunkenness of it and so forth. And you should be what? Watching. Watch ye therefore and praying. And pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. How do you plan on standing before the Son of Man? How is anybody going to stand before the Son of Man unless they've been taken somewhere? This is those in Christ above 14 years, which is at the very beginning, right as the 50 days is about to start. This is that group. So they're not caught up in the cares of the world, not caught up in the drunkenness of things. They're watching, they're praying. You go to Hebrews chapter 11 with Enoch. Enoch had what? Faith. And he believed that God was what? A rewarder of them who diligently sought him. So you have watching, praying, diligently seeking the Lord. Right? You have to be repentant, of course. Diligent in your faith. Loving others. It's all fulfilled in that, right? Even in in love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your might and all your mind, right? Everything. And love your neighbor as yourself. The law is fulfilled in that. So you have to have love as well. And then what? Baptized. I absolutely believe baptism is a part for those going pre-trib as well. So if you haven't been baptized, I highly recommend that you do not go to Matthew chapter 28, baptism, but that you do the baptism of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Okay? Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And I do plan on doing a teaching on this. It's been a few years since I've done a, a full teaching on the baptism, but I'm going to do one either the next video, maybe the one after. I don't have it uh, exactly when. But this is our baptism. Okay? The baptism of Matthew chapter 28 is for the Jews. It's not for us. You see, it says in 238, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is our baptism. And I do believe it is part of it as well. Okay? So if you haven't been baptized, get baptized. You know, a lot of people say, well, if I go, when I go to my church, they're saying, well, they're not doing baptisms for, for another, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, another two months, and then they're doing baptisms. Well, you ask them if maybe you can do a special baptism. You know, you can do one separately. Somebody can do one for you or something. And if they won't, then talk to a, a brother or sister in Christ and ask them to baptize you. If you don't have anybody near you, if there's nobody that can baptize you, then send me an email and I'll send you an email of what I send to people in those situations. But try your hardest to find somebody to bat excuse me, to find somebody to baptize you. All right? So that is a, a, a picture of those going pre-trib. Now we just saw in Luke's discourse the pre-trip. When you're going to see when we go to Mark's, there is no pre-trip. Uh, there is no mid-trip being talked about at the coming of the Lord. In Matthew's, in the Matthew 24 section, at the coming of the Lord, it's not him gathering them all back for those that will dwell in the city when he's returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. The descriptions that we get in Luke, Mark, and Matthew's discourse of the coming of the Lord are of his periods of time that he's coming in the end of days. You see, it's so hard for people to grasp because they've been told for decades that the Lord will not return again until he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Whether you believe in pre-trib or mid-trib, they all tell you that the Lord doesn't return until feet down on the Mount of Olives. We have proven that is absolutely not true. And you're going to see it here revealed in the discourses and recognize it in the differences within how the discourses are spoken. This is the only one that clearly explains to you a pre-trib to escape absolutely everything. Okay? Which means when we get to this point of the coming of the Son of Man in Luke 20, 21, 25, 
uh, through 28 right here, you're going to notice this isn't the pre-trib. This is speaking to something else that happens after the pre-trib is already been taken. So knowing that 2 Corinthians chapter 12 just said that there's a group that goes above and they're going to the third heaven. And we know from teachings that we've done many times over the years and really broken down and explained this 50 day period of time that would begin from the 8th to the 9th of Av. Then that means the bride's going at that time frame, as we've explained and shown uh, a fair bit recently. And you could see it right here in the Jewish calendar or it's the Gregorian with the Hebrew calendar uh, overlaid on it. So here we are tonight, July 19th, and we're in one screenshot, guys. We're in one screenshot to August 12th. August 12th is the true end of the seventh Sabbath of the Feast of Weeks. And when it ends, brothers and sisters, I hope we're all in Christ. I hope everybody listening has shared it with others, has spoken to others, because here's the thing. Even if they don't want to believe now, whether they want to believe in Christ or whatever the case may be, you've shared it with them so that when these things begin to come to pass, who do you think they're going to think about? They're going to think about the person who literally told them it was at hand. And when you see these things begin to come to pass, you will know that the scriptures and that Christ is true and that every word is the truth from the word of God. Nobody else will have been able to say, look, tens of millions of people are going to vanish. And then in October, Jerusalem will be attacked and World War Three will start. How, how could you have known that? You see, so we share. We don't hammer them over the head with it. We simply share it. And. Let the Spirit work in them to open their eyes and to open their ears and to receive the Lord. All right? So this is that time that we're looking at, which is directly related to this right here and those going in the above, which is 50, going to the third heaven, those in Christ Spirit-filled. We know, and I don't want to take a lot of time in this part, but we know all of the events, I mean, we've shared on them quite a bit because a lot of the pre-stuff and the events that take place in the 50 days, there's a lot. <coughs> but what we want to understand here is the details that were given in the discourses. And so what happens is when the pre-trib happens, without going into all the details of it, we know that there is a seven-day wedding that is taking place in the third heaven when the pre-trib is taken. We've explained it. We've broken it down from, from uh, Luke chapter 12 in the warning that he gives to the parable of the wedding found in Luke. And then what happens when he returns from the wedding? So he, he has, of course, we know he has a group of people that he's prepared, that he's left behind, that he will instruct to be ready when he returns from the wedding, which means what? Which means the Lord is coming back on the eighth day after the wedding. So if you're newer, that would mean the Lord is returning right here on the eighth day after the seven-day wedding from the pre-trib. The Lord is returning as the Son of Man, as he said he would in Luke chapter 11, to be a warning to Jerusalem, to warn as he said he would warn as Jonah did. We see in Luke 19... Another prophetic insight of this, which is a prophetic typology built with into it, uh, built within it from the triumphal entry, which is a typology of Christ coming after the wedding in the prophetic end of days, when he weeps, which we only see in Luke's gospel in chapter 19. You don't find it in Mark's and you don't find it in Matthew's. And what does he do? He comes near, he weeps over it. And he says in Luke 19, starting in verse 42, saying, If thou had known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee that thine, uh, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and shall compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. And they shall slay thee even 
uh, with the ground, and thy children with thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thine visitation. Because they knew not what? Because like what Luke 21 just told us, he just said in Luke 21 that if you're not watching and praying, that if you're caught up in the cares and the drunkenness of the things of this world, then you're not going to be aware of what's coming, and you'll be what? Caught unawares? You weren't ready, you didn't understand, you weren't paying attention for the time of his visitation? And what happens to the whole world? They're caught in the snare. You see? This is what he's talking about. But he goes on to talk about more. Because this coming of the Son of Man is the Son of Man coming as the white horse rider. Not maybe, not kind of, not sort of. It is absolutely, it is revealed, it is understood. We've shared it. We've got a video on it. It was just a recent video. If you hadn't seen it, and if you haven't watched that playlist with the first four, you start there, then you can come and watch this and, and, and listen to the one we're doing right now. This reveals the revelation of the one verse and the three key words given to us about the white horse rider. And we can prove it out in the discourses themselves. Because remember Luke's portion is called above 14 years? What happens after the above is over? It would be the red horse rider. How do we know it's the red horse rider? Let's go to Revelation chapter 6. And look at what we see. In the red horse rider... Uh, starting in verse 4, it says, And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. The dove is the peace, right? So the, the Holy Ghost, we know on day 50, is going to anoint this, this end of the above 50, right? That above portion, before the 14 year starts, that's the 50 days. And on that 50th day, it'll be the anointing of the Holy Ghost that we call Acts 2.0. It'll be that remnant group that we were just talking about that are going to serve the Lord doing what? Well, if they're serving the Lord, they're doing the works of the fourth turning, right? They're doing the works in that stage to bring about victory for the Lord. And then what happens? Peace is taken from the earth. When that 50 days is over, peace is removed. And what happens? And that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. We well, are going to see. When we get into Mark's gospel in his discourse, you're going to see when that 14 years, when the tribulation of the 14 years begins at the red horse rider. The white horse, we don't need to go into all of it. You can go watch that video that we just recently did, that teaching on it, to show you what the bow is, why a crown was given unto him because it was given to him by his mother at his wedding, which was the pre-trib wedding. And the word for conquering and to conquer, it is all revealed. In fact, I was just having a, a Zoom meeting the other day with a, a brother Brian, and you know we've we've broken down the bow. We understand what this means, what it related to, but what is the bow's definition? It's just called simple fabric. Okay, now we've broken it down. You can go watch that video. But as another little additional side note, as Brian and I were talking, what what would something like a, a simple fabric, like a simple white cloth, think of something simple, meaning white as well, because it wouldn't be dyed. So just a simple white sheet. Why would that have any interest to us, brothers and sisters? Why would that have any meaning to us when we know that the 40 days of the Son of Man are related to what? The 40 days is the birth of Christ, Luke in order. What was Christ wrapped in? A simple fabric? A swaddling cloth, right? A white fabric that he, they wrapped him in at his birth? And what does this relate to? <clears throat> the white horse rider 
who is the Son of Man, coming at a time that is represented, not on his birthday, but represented as the 40 days of his birth. Of which we've got videos that teach on this as well. This is him coming as the Son of Man in Luke chapter 21 in his discourse. You see, a lot of people say, well, I thought the seals were broken. How is he in heaven breaking the seals and yet still here? Well, you have to read what Revelation 6, 1 says carefully. Then the Lamb opened one of the seals. One. One of the seals are opened. And he goes out as the white horse rider. And watch that video if you really want to grasp it. And see that he is the white horse rider. So when does the Son of Man leave? If he came on the eighth day, and there were 50 days total, he came on the eighth, so that would be seven days plus 40 days. That'd be 47 days, three more days before the 50 days are over, which means he now is returned. He's back. He's left, like you would see in Acts chapter 1. He's gone to heaven. And what happens? Well, now there's three more days before the anointing of the Holy Ghost, before peace is taken from the earth, which would be what? When the red horse rider, when the second seal is then opened. Hello. Now it makes sense when you see this wording, doesn't it? When the lamb opened one of the seals. You see, it, it didn't even call it the first seal. It is the first seal. It does mean first. But it's to let you know that he only opened one first. Okay. And the one will play out on its own. And then when it comes to the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, they, they, some will start, some will end, some will pause for a little bit and then pick up and be stronger in another period. You see, they, it's not just one seal per year. That's not how it works. But the first one is the first one opened, and it's the 40 days of the Son of Man, which is the coming of the Son of Man in Luke chapter 21. And let me show you, if you're newer, how to distinguish that and understand it. Because this is something, if you hadn't seen the, the intro series yet, you will understand. But here it says, starting in verse 25, And there shall be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them. People are going to be having heart attacks seeing what's coming upon the earth. For fear for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. This we've shown is related to the coming of the Son of Man to begin his 40 days, which is connected to events happening during the seven days. And as he's coming on the eighth day is the Psalms 18 events that we covered just recently. In, in fact, in that last teaching, Enoch right on target. Now listen to what it says next in verse 27 and 28. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in, which means in, a cloud, singular. Not plural, singular. So he's coming in a cloud. So he's going to be on the white horse in this cloud, and it says coming with power and great glory. Do you think the whole world is going to see him? No. What might they see in this? I don't know. Will they grasp it and understand it? No, definitely not. He's not coming as the Son of Man as lightning from one end to the other. He's coming as Jonah was. He's coming as the Son of Man for 40 days. To warn as Jonah did. To warn as you saw in uh, Luke chapter 19. In fact, listen to what it says next. And when these things begin to come to pass... Then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. In the past, I used to wonder and, and flip-flop back and forth to whether this is them seeing the pre-trib before verse 36, or if it was the remnant group that he said to be ready when he returned from the wedding. This is who it is. The pre-trib is escaping seeing all of these things that he said are mentioned. So they're not going to see any of this. This is all about the Son of Man coming for 40 days, 
the events that are going to be seen as he's coming back from the end of the wedding and the shaking and all this stuff that's coming and this redemption that's coming nigh. Yes, because there is a redemption coming for the world, but it is about the remnant group that were waiting for him upon his return from the wedding that he will then have that banquet meal with as we shared and he will then go about they i would assume they will follow him to some extent maybe go out in groups of two with him you know or once he informs them at the meal and gives them more power they would go out working and then be gathered back to him maybe towards the end of the 40 days but what else do we know the lord is doing well, if he's going to do as he said he would in Jonah 11, as Jonah, I mean, uh, in Luke 11, as Jonah did, then that means he's going to be warning. And in Luke 19, he's warning that they're going to be compassed about and then destroyed. And is that what he says? Well, let's go a little bit further up and see what he tells us. In Luke 21, 20, we see it right here. This is what Jesus is going to be doing when he's here for 40 days. He says, and when they shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter there into. You see, you don't see all this same wording right here in what we're going to read next in the rest of the discourses. It says, for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. What's he, what's he warning about? Jerusalem is about to be compassed about, destroyed, and this is now going to be the beginning of all things that were written. Everything in the, in the prophecies about the end of days are now about to begin, which means what? He's warning that once this compassing about happens after his 40 days are done, because he's warning about it before it happens, then when he's gone, the raven spirit, that antichrist spirit goes out and Jerusalem is now being compassed about, but they won't be attacked until the anointing of the Holy Ghost happens on these people. And like we read in Luke 24 is they're now going out, they're told, from Jerusalem. And only Luke's gospel tells that remnant worker group that when they're anointed from, from above, from the Father, by the Holy Ghost, that they will depart from Jerusalem. Once they've departed from Jerusalem, Jerusalem will now have been attacked and destroyed. That will be the beginning of the 14 years and the beginning, the official beginning of World War III with the attack and the destruction of Jerusalem. That will happen on the day and hour no one knows. It will happen <clears throat> as the 50 days come to an end at the anointing of the Holy Ghost, Elul 29, and on the day and hour, Feast of Trumpets, two days, on the day and hour no one knows will be the attack on Jerusalem after the compassing about that took place once the Son of Man had left. And listen to what it goes on to say. So now you see, even right here in verse 22, for all these be the day, uh, sorry, for these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now it's all about to begin. Did it already start in the 50 days? Tens of millions of people vanishing. The Lord being here for 40 days. He's not walking around proclaiming he's the son of man here for 40 days. He's walking around and doing as Jonah did. He's coming as a prophet. To, to warn them and to let them know what's coming. To flee to the mountains when they see they're about to be compassed about. He's coming to warn that it's all about to begin and will be fulfilled. Then it says, But woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. Huh. Did we just not read in Revelation, the red horse rider, when the sword is given? Hello. And shall be led away captive. Why? Because the Jews are going to be compassed about. They're going to have to flee to the mountains. Many will be killed. Many will be taken captive. You see? And shall be taken captive 
into all nations and Jerusalem listen to this shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled well when you realize that the seven years of seals is the portion of of the world which is the house of Israel and the Gentiles are grafted in hello are the Gentiles not grafted in to the house of Israel Absolutely they are. So if the great multitude rapture is to the house of Israel and their Gentiles are grafted in because they're so mixed together, nobody knows who the house of Israel is anymore, right? And so they're all grafted in together. When would be the end of the time of the Gentiles? To the end of seals. Which is what we see and we will cover in Mark's discourse. Which means now all of this is going to take place in their captivity and everything until the end of seals, until that seventh year of seals. It, it, it's crystal clear. Once you understand the revelation of the differences in the Gospels being prophetically revealed as differences in who the groups are that are being spoken to. And then realize that 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is the revelation of the end of days, the portion called above, followed by the 14 years. Now we'll go up further. Look at what we read in the beginning of Luke's discourse, or close to the beginning. In Luke 21, verse 9, But when you shall hear of wars and of commotions, be not terrified. These things must come to pass, but the end is not by and by. That might actually be related to, to the first attack coming on Israel in the north. So when the pre-trib happens, as we've taught, there's two attacks coming on Israel. The first one, when the pre-trib is taken, uh, I believe it'll be Haifa and Tel Aviv. It'll be two northern cities attacked, and that will bring about a short-lived uh, war in Israel. This might be that, as we see building right now. Okay, But then, this is where it really starts to kick in. Listen to what this says. Luke 21, verse 10, is very specific in what we read like this. Then said he unto them. So Luke writes in with his own words, then said he unto them, as, the, as if there, there's a group over there that the Lord was talking to, which relates to what? Mark's group and Matthew's group. So what does he say? He says, Nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. But now, as you guys have heard me teach on this numerous times over the years, listen to what verse 12 says, only found in Luke, which is why you have him jumping in with his own words, then said he unto them. Because, brothers and sisters, what is nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom? It's the red horse rider when the sword is given. It's the time of the red horse rider when they will fall by the edge of the sword and it will become nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So what does it mean in verse 12 when he says, oh, but before all of these, there's only one thing that means before. If the red horse rider begins the 14 years at the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, then that means what he's talking about here is a period of time in the portion called above. So he's talking about a period of time in this above portion being even during the 40 days, but things that they will also endure because they're the remnant workers, but these things that they will endure even in the midst of these 40 days. Listen to what it says. But before all these, which can only be, in, like I said, only be in the above portion, meaning it's where it begins. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate what you shall before not to meditate before what you shall answer for I will give you a mouth and wisdom 
which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And you shall be betrayed, both by parents and brethren and kinfolk and friends, and some of you they shall cause to be put to death. But you shall be, and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess you your souls. So what are some key points that we saw? They're going to be delivering you up uh, into synagogues and into prisons. Some of you are going to be killed and put, like, put to death. And you're going to be betrayed by friends and family and parents and so forth. But not a hair of your head will perish. Let's see what we can find out about this, which we taught on in the seven churches. Well, we know that this group that the Lord will have the banquet with when he returns on the eighth day as the Son of Man for 40 days in the portion of above, we see and know that it relates to a group who is represented as Smyrna. And we see in Smyrna this exact wording that we were talking about. In Smyrna, Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, it says, Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you, there's that word, some of you, into prison. Luke's is the only one that said that. That you may be tried and have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. So we see the suffering. We see the some of you. We see cast into prison. And we see some put to death. This is that remnant Smyrna group who will put their necks on the line, serving him, doing works for the Lord, and will be rewarded for him in the victory at the end. Just like the fourth turning. You see? Where else do we see this in Revelation? Well, what did it say? It said, but not a hair of your head will be hurt, right? If we go to Revelation chapter 13, it shows us that this group isn't only with the Lord here for 40 days and following him and doing things for 40 days, but that they will also remain to serve him during the rest of the time of seals. And we see it right here. When the beast has his power to continue, right? It says, let's start in uh, Revelation 13, verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him on, over all kindred and tongues and nations, and all that dwell on the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, slain from the foundation of the world. Let any man, uh, let any man have an ear, let him hear. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword will be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. You see, this is their portion, them working during seals while others are wildly having come into the faith in the midst of the chaos of World War III in the first half of seals. And the patience and faith of the saints is willing to die and putting their necks on the line during the time of tribulation during seals. So we're seeing all of these events that the Lord is talking about in Luke chapter 21, all being related to this portion called, but before. It's this period that comes before nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, which is what? When the sword is given so that they could kill each other, which is the red horse rider, which begins on the day and hour no one knows when the 50 days are over and the 14 years then begin. So if it starts the 14 years at the red horse rider, and the white horse rider is someone who's here before the red in a portion before it's nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And we're told about what this before is. And it's the group here with Christ while he's warning, as he said he would for 40 days as Jonah. How much more evidence do you need? It's the son of man. But you must understand that intro series to understand what's being said is the white horse rider revelation 
and then track what's being said here as we continue on in these differences within the within the gospels and their synoptic gospels uh, uh synoptic discourses to follow and track everything that's being revealed this everything spoken in this portion is things that take place during the lord's 40 days for which then three more days while they're waiting for the anointing of the holy ghost and then on the day and hour no one knows at the beginning of the 14 years at the red horse rider is when the chaos and the warning that he warned them against from being compassed about and to flee would then begin at them falling by the edge of the sword which is what we've been revealing and teaching over and over and over again over the years. The 14 years begins with the destruction of Jerusalem. And this coming of the Son of Man is him coming in a single cloud. It is him coming as the Jonah prophecy. I mean, as the, as the, yeah, yeah, as the Jonah prophecy in Luke 11 coming as the white horse rider, as he said he would for 40 days, as the 40 days of Noah, okay? Not the whole Matthew 24, but as him in Luke 17, when he said he would come first in his days. So remember when we just saw this, when he says in verse 12, he says, but before all these, we know this is the beginning of the 40 days and the Son of Man here after the wedding. Well, when you go to Luke 17, you get the clarity also that it's the Son of Man during his 40 days there. And we see it down here when they're asking him prophetically about when this will all begin. In verse 24 of Luke 17, he says, For as lightning lighteth out of one part of heaven and shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. Well, this isn't when he comes pre-trib. It's not even when he comes mid-trib. This, as you're going to see later, is when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives as lightning from one end unto the other. So what does he then say? Oh, but before all this, remember in Luke, but before these things, look at what verse 25 says, but first. What did Luke 21 say? Luke 21 is the only, ones, only one that says, but before all these things, you see? This is the same context, same connection about him coming first like this, which is re directly related to his 40 days. Luke 17, 25, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. When you see something like this, this generation, it's always in the prophetic in relation to the final generation. And then it says, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days. You see, he went from singular to plural. So shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. So what days does it relate to? They did eat, they drank, they married wives, and were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. What does he relate his period of but first when he comes first for? He relates them to the 40 days of the flood of Noah. What, is, what does he relate them to in, in Luke 11? He relates them to the 40 days as he said he would do to warn as Jonah did. When he's here during the 40 days, what is he doing? He's warning as he said he would them being compassed about in Luke 11. And in Luke 21, he is telling them about this compassing about that would then bring about the sword and destroy them. What else is the 40 days? Well, if the, the white horse rider, even in that the, the, the bow, a simple fabric, it relates to what? When we've revealed it, Luke in order, it relates to a prophetic type of him coming at the time of his birth, but as we know, two months off, based on the revelation of Isaiah 9 and Matthew chapter 4, but the relation is still to his birth. What was, the, what was the Luke chapter 2 in relation to the Lord's birth? 40 days. Seriously? From the days of Noah, 40 days? 
from his birth 40 days and from the Jonah 40 days. The Son of Man is coming for 40 days in the above portion during those 50 days. It doesn't get any more clear. It is absolutely the Son of Man coming for 40 days. And when we get into now going into Matthew's discourse, you're going to notice this in Mark and Matthew's as well, is this fantastic difference in the coming of the Son of Man, which in Luke's, as we said a moment ago, is in, and it means in, Okay, the Greek word 1722 in the in a cloud singular. Okay. When you understand these differences and these things being said in the in the Gospels in their differences. Everything will start to open up to you and you will begin to see with what we see uh, end time eyes. Okay, so now we've seen what's going to take place, what's going to begin during the 40 days. We see that they're going to be hated they're going to be betrayed by family by friends by by brethren some of them are going to be put to death this is only within the 40 days and it continues in through seals but it starts in the 40 days guys you under you understand right for those remnant workers the 50 days begins in 23 23 and a half or so and then you've got Another, what, seven days, and then the 40 days begin? Wild. Wild, wild stuff. So now, look at this. When we go to Luke's uh, Transfiguration story, <coughs> which we just recently did, a teaching on uh, called Before the Transfiguration, I think it's called. Let's go have a look at it. So if you haven't seen it, you can go watch it for yourself. Yeah. Before the transfiguration, and you're going to see this difference in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, but we're not going to go into them all, except what I want to show you in <clears throat> Luke's transfiguration is what is the fact that you read nothing about Elijah or John being Elijah who came first. Why wouldn't you read anything? About this, because it, this here in Luke's transfiguration story is another prophetic typology built within it of the Lord coming on the eighth day to begin his 40 days. We've broken that down in that teaching. We've done it a number of times over the years as well. And we see nothing about the conversation of Elijah as Jonah. I mean, as as John the Baptist. And the reason we don't is because of what we just read in Luke chapter 21. They're going to be betrayed. So they're still in that above portion where the betrayal is taking place. You see? Because remember, if you're being betrayed by your by family, right? By fathers and sons, mothers and daughters and brethren and kinfolk and all that stuff. Well, then that means the Elijah John portion hasn't yet been fulfilled. They might be there. And they're 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 a an Elijah group as we shared in that recent video, that remnant portion of Smyrna that's remaining, putting their necks on the lines, where some of them will be put to death. But that means when we go to Mark's discourse, what we should end up seeing now is now the beginning of the fourteen years, when it becomes nation against nation. We should still see where it's uh, mother against daughter. Uh, father against son, you know, where they're still against each other, family members and so forth, because it's still the portion of seals. And remember that it's the Elijah John the Baptist, which is represented by that remnant group of workers who will be the ones who will restore father to son, mother to daughter by the end of seals for the time of the great multitude rapture which means in relation to Mark's transfiguration story, that's why you're going to see it when we get there because Mark's transfiguration story is a prophetic picture of the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. And when he comes, father and son, mother and daughter, they'll be restored for the time of the great multitude rapture during this restoration that will have been taking place in the midst of chaos and, and some going against each other. But by the end, this restoration taking place. 
That's how you know their portion is until the end of seals. So now watch what happens here. Here's Mark's discourse, and we'll start in verse 8. Look at this. No black letter words that come first to say, then he said unto them. Mark's discourse begins with, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. This verse right here is the first approximately two and a half years of tribulation that begin with the attack that the Lord was warning about in the above during his 40 days that then happened at the Feast of Trumpets on the day and hour no one knows to begin the 14 years. That began with nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And then you've got earthquakes, you've got famines, you've got troubles, and these are called the beginnings of sorrows. Could you imagine? World War III, famines, troubles all over the earth, earthquakes. World War III in the end of days is called the beginning of sorrows. It's hard to fathom till you understand what you, when you're reading what comes after. What comes after about two and a half years of seals? What is this? Red Horse Rider. Do you, do you see anything but before or but first? Nope. You know what this is. Luke's told you. Because now it's the time of the sword which is nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, which is the red horse rider when the sword is given that they should kill one another. And that begins the 14 years. On the day and hour no one knows, based on revelation of scripture from Zechariah to Jeremiah to Isaiah to Daniel. So now watch what happens. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils uh, and in the synagogues, and you shall be beaten and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my name's sake, for, uh, for my name's sake, for a testimony against them. Remember, the other guys are, 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 are the workers, right? Doing the works, putting their necks on the line to bring about this great harvest for the Lord. And what are you seeing now? Well, you're going to see these people in the midst of the great revival that has broken out after the pre-trib has happened. Even in, in all of the chaos, now the 14 years has begun. Nation against nation started with Jerusalem, with Syria and those with Syria that are going to attack them. And now it's begun. You saw like Patrick Beck David in that interview. What happened with 9-11 as we've taught over the years? You see the churches were full for about six months. I mean, sorry, for about six weeks. And then people started to settle down and let it go out of their mind a bit. What do you think will happen when tens of millions of people vanish from the earth and tribulation begins with World War III. It'll be the greatest revival in human history. You see? Purposed by the Lord. This fourth turning is the final turning. It says, and the gospel must first be published and uh, among all nations. But when they shall lead, uh, sorry, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought before what you shall speak, neither do you premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not you that speaketh, but the Holy Ghost. Listen to this. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents. And will cause them to be put to death. Huh. Right? Is it, weren't we just reading about that? You see, when you understand what Jesus was saying, where did we go even into Malachi? Is it Malachi chapter 4? No, chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3... Uh, Book of Remembrance, da, 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 da. maybe it was four. Let me check two. No, I think it was four. I just read too quickly, maybe. We know, uh, oh yeah, right here, okay? So in verse 
in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So if we're reading from Luke's discourse, when it begins, when it's families against each other, and we're in Mark's, and in Mark's, we're in the portion in the first two and a half years, the, the beginning portion of the seals of tribulation, the first two and a half years of the 14 years, and they're against each other. Well, then clearly all of this restoring hasn't yet happened. It won't actually be fulfilled until the end of the sixth year of seals at the coming of the Lord on heavenly Mount Zion. And Jesus himself in Luke chapter 12 told us that when he's coming in the prophetic during the 40 days like we were back in Luke, listen to what he says. He says in starting in verse 49, Luke chapter 12, verse 49, I am come to send fire on the earth and what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with and how I am straightened till it be accomplished. Suppose you that I am come to give peace on earth? I tell you nay, but rather division. You see, he's coming to bring division as the son of man, to side with him or to choose the enemy. And it's going to cause division in the families. From henceforth, there shall be five in one house divided, uh, in one house divided three against two, and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, huh? And the son against the father. And then, of course, the mother and the daughter and the daughter-in-law and mother-in-law and all that. This is what he's warning about, that he's coming to bring division also in the midst of those 40 days. <clears throat> and that's why you're reading in, Luke's discourse, uh, in Mark's discourse how it started in Luke, but now, as the 14 years had begun, and some are coming to Christ and some are still refusing that you're seeing this division in the families in the midst of the two and a half years of seals. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure until the end shall be saved. You see, those who endure until the end of seals, or you could even say even in Christ, that those that will endure in him in the midst of these trials of tribulation of seals, even unto their death, okay? It could be unto their end will be saved. But it also means those who will endure until the end of seals will be saved as well. You know, there's no baptism needed during seals. Interesting, right? But it makes complete sense when you realize people are fleeing for their lives. You see, at the point we're at, in relation to the seven churches even, we see it in relation to the beginning of 50 days, the beginning of 40 days on the eighth day, but both of these groups, the apostles and the, the new disciples, are going to be working until the end of seals. But what begins even at the 40 days? Remember what it said? Persecution. It's going to be a period of wandering that's going to take place. It's not yet the time of fleeing into the wilderness in what we've covered, but there's going to be wanderings. The first, even though this represents the beginning of the 40 days, it also represents continuing until the midst of seals about two and a half years in to the point when Antichrist gets his power, which is where we are right here. So all of this in Luke, I mean, in Mark chapter 13 from verse 8, to 13 is talking about the first two about two and a half years of seals this is the first two and a half years of seals and world war three as i said is being told to us as simply being the beginning of sorrows that's not easy to to comprehend it's hard to wrap around our, our minds around what that actually could mean that World War III is just called the beginning of it? It's just, it's just the start of all of this? 
with earthquakes and famine and troubles, which is disturbances of water, by the way, that these are all just the beginning? Well, you saw that within Smyrna. It's, it's the period of, you know, what was and, and the is of a time of wandering. It's not yet the fleeing into the wilderness because the Antichrist hasn't received his power yet. Will the Antichrist spirit be here? Sure. But will the Antichrist in the first two and a half years of seals represented here in Mark 13, verse 8 through 13, has the Antichrist received his power yet to be able to go and start attacking Christians and have people worship him? No. But is he here? Will the systems be in place and implemented fully? Absolutely. That's what's going to be happening during the first about two and a half years of seals in the midst of the chaos. It'll be two and a half years of putting these things in order in the midst of World War III. So why World War III? What, what else does World War III do? Well, it'll wake people up. It'll have them crying out to Christ because it, they need to be prepared. They're going to need to be prepared and willing for what's coming next, which is going to be when the Antichrist gets his power. You see? Because up to this point, up to two and a half years into SEALs, is World War III and in the midst of famine, in the midst of World War III, Worse than anything World War II ever was even close to. And people so hungry and so famished. Famine from the word, except for those that will be going around teaching and preaching. It will be a famine from actual food and water. People dying in the streets. Why is this happening? So that when he gets his power to continue 42 months when he receives that power as the beast to step forward everybody will be crying out for anybody to save them imagine a full on every nation on earth involved in war yep every nation involved in world war 3 and in war against neighbors and so forth all of that devastation taking place in the first two and a half years, all of that death, all of that famine and destruction and, and all of that chaos, those not in Christ will be crying out for anybody to save them. And that's when the beast stands forward, having received his power to now take over and continue. That's why it says continue in Revelation chapter 13. Now he's going to continue, but it's when his power will come to force and he will now be the global leader that everybody will turn to. We see it in Revelation chapter 13. And what is Revelation chapter 13? It's about when the beast rises up, right? The beast from the sea. Having seven heads and ten horns, now the ten horns each have their crowns. He gets his power from the dragon. And what does it say? It says in verse 4, And they worship the dragon who gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Why? Because somehow he will settle World War III. There's still going to be war across the earth, but he's going to overall settle World War III. And people are now going to turn to him as the leader who will now provide for food and what is needed. And listen to what we read. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. Now he gets the power as the beast that most people understand of Revelation. This is when he now has that power. And what's going to happen? 
it says, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindred and tongue and nations. See that? He's given power over the whole earth now as the beast. And the saints are now going to have to be putting their necks on the line and fleeing. And it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the, in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And then we have what we spoke earlier. He that leads into captivity shall go into captivity. All right. So those pointing on their neighbors and telling on their neighbors and doing that, they'll, they themselves will also end up in captivity. And he that kills with the sword must also be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So now he's getting his power. And he's now going to continue for 42 months. Well, when you understand that the first two and a half years was World War III and everything beginning with the attack on Jerusalem, and now he's got 42 months, which is what? Three and a half years, which will bring you to the end of the sixth year of seals. Well, what is, if it starts or when it starts at Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows, what would be six, uh, uh, two and a half years later? It would be Passover time. So it would be Passover, 24 Feast of Trumpets to 25 Feast of Trumpets to 26 Feast of Trumpets to Passover. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, uh, um, 25 Feast of Trumpets to 26 uh, uh, and Feast of Trumpets. Yeah, actually, this is to uh, Feast of Trumpets. So in that 27th year, Feast of Trumpets, two and a half years into tribulation, it's now Passover time. So at Passover time would be like what? When he gets his power to continue, 42 months takes place. But it's also just like when what? When Moses fled into the wilderness? When he told all of Israel and they fled into the wilderness? Well, what do we know? We know that there's not just an Elijah type of John the Baptist in the end of days, but there is a uh, Moses type as well. And look at what happens in Mark 13, 14. And when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not. That's not what Matthew says. Matthew says it differently. There's a reason. Let him that readeth understand, let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Now you got another fleeing of the mountains. What is this fleeing all about? What is this fleeing all about? This fleeing is the, let's go back to Revelation 13. This fleeing is the abomination of desolation of when the beast gets his power to continue for 42 months. Who's going to make war against them now, right? And what does he do? He now turns his attention to all the Christians and everybody that's converted and whoever becomes converted from that point forward. This is when he now turns to go after all of them. And what else happens? The false prophet shows up who's called the second beast, the one out of the earth. We know that this is the false prophet because Revelation 19 tells us that the first beast, right, that the beast and the false prophet both are thrown into the lake of fire first at the end of tribulation. And what do we see about the false prophet? Well, we're told that the false prophet in Revelation 19 is the one who got everybody to follow and to take the mark and to worship the first beast. So we know that this second beast is clearly the false prophet. And what does this false prophet do? Revelation 13, 12. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and he causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, here's what we need to understand. I won't go into all of it. We've, got, we've done a great video, and we've shared on it a couple of times. His deadly wound was healed, remember? The beast whose deadly wound was healed. So, 
if we go to Revelation chapter 17, you're now going to see something. In Revelation chapter 17, it explains to us who the beast is, right? His portions of time. It says right here in Revelation 17, verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was, this represents where we are right now talking in Mark, when he gets his power to continue for 42 months to end World War III, right? So he was, <coughs> excuse me, he is not, because we'll get to that, because at the end of the six-year seals, he's killed by the Lord when he comes on Mount Zion. And then it says, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. The was was his 42 months. The is not is the final seventh year of seals and the first half of trumpets. And then the shall is at mid trumpets when he comes out of the bottomless pit and goes into perdition. So where we are right now is in the was. This is when he has his power to continue for 42 months. So when we're reading, you have to understand that, oh, his deadly wound, head wound was healed. Wouldn't that be where he's not? And then he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit? No. Because listen to what it says further down. The beast was, is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Okay? Listen to what it says about him. It says, uh, da -da -da, verse 11, And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goes into perdition, which means the the seven heads of the beast, right? So the beast had seven heads. Of those seven heads, when the final head is destroyed, the eighth one comes from among the seven. You see, we explained it and we broke it down in Daniel chapter eight before. So he's coming from among the seven or the seventh one. So when you see that his deadly head wound was, was healed, it's the seventh one and him being the eighth, which is from the seven. Which means in the was, he is the eighth. In the is not, he was the eighth that was killed. And when he goes into perdition, when he shall be, he's still the eighth. It's the deadly head wound of the seventh for which he comes up of the seventh. You see, the, the, the head of the beast only had seven heads. So why would we have an eighth? Because he's coming up from the seventh. And we read about that in Daniel. They relate to the mountains and the horns being mountains. So when we see this in Revelation 13, it's telling us that he it, it's, it's the beast who is the eighth, who has come up as the eighth from that another mountain peak coming up from the seventh one. And that's the deadly head wound restored. That is that seventh head being restored, which is being called the eighth that is of the seventh. You following? And so what are we seeing here? Remember, we're in the midst of Mark's discourse. And what are we seeing? We're now seeing the false prophet point everybody to him and to get everybody to worship him and to do what? To worship his image. And for those who weren't, who won't worship his image, that they should be killed. Okay? Causes both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in, which by the way means on, his right hand, or in, which means on, their foreheads. That they might not, what? Buy or sell, save they have the mark uh, or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So you can have the mark, the name, or the number of the name, or the number of his name. So what are we seeing here? What is the mark of the beast all about? It has to do with the temple, doesn't it? Not a physical stone temple being built, but the temple that is the body, because during the time of the Gentiles, which is still during the time of seals, the temple is still the physical body. It is still the temple of God dwelling in people. Which means, when are they fleeing in Mark 13? 
in Mark 13, they're now fleeing because the beast in the abomination of desolation in Mark 13, starting verse 14, is the abomination of desolation, which is the mark of the beast being placed where it ought not, which is on the hand or on the forehead. It's being placed what? On the flesh, or some might say in the flesh, but the description says on. So it's being placed on the flesh, which is where it ought not, right? It shouldn't happen. But what is the temple now, even in the midst of seals? It's the people that, are, that have Christ, that have accepted Christ. They're the temple of God. So what are they? They're people walking around covered in skin, right? I love this when I first discovered this. You guys will remember this as well, right? It was so exciting because the first temple was Moses' temple, right? And the temple was where? In the wilderness. Where are these guys fleeing to? In the wilderness. When are they fleeing in the timeline? Six and a half, uh, two, two and a half years in the tribulation would be at Passover time. Which means they're fleeing at the time of Passover just like the days of Noah. I mean, uh, just like in Moses' day. And in Moses' day, the temple was what? Number one, it was portable. Well, what are people? They're portable. They move around everywhere. What was Moses' temple covered in? Skins. What are people covered in? Skin. And they walk around everywhere. It's the portable temple covered in skin. And it's the time of the mark of the beast when he comes to power to continue for 42 months. What you'll notice now is another fascinating piece of revelation that came a, a few years ago now where when you were when we were in Luke's discourse you saw no mention of false christs or false prophets. In the first half <clears throat> of Mark's discourse, the first two and a half years of tribulation, there's no mention of false Christs or false prophets. Then what do we get? The abomination of desolation when they're to flee into the wilderness, right? And that would now begin the church of Pergamum, which was Constantine, the Antichrist type, and what is it? The time of fleeing into the wilderness. Pretty wild how that works, right? Well, you'll remember the teaching we did on this in the fleeing into the wilderness. It relates to the was of the Old Testament, whereas this is the is, the is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib, and in the is to come, it's a picture of the Antichrist, and in the was, it's the picture of the Antichrist and the false prophet that we saw, I think it was Numbers 24 or 25, which when we go to the seven churches, it is so incredible because when we go to it, we can see the historical picture being represented as the time of martyrs and who? Balaam and Balak, as we taught on in that new seven churches. And who did Balak represent? Balak, watch this. We'll go to Balak. He represented the king. So Balak, in the time of Pergamum, which is the time of the beast getting his power, he is going to be the, the beast king. We also have Balaam, who was what? The false prophet or the false teacher, which we see right here, was their prophet. Crazy! Everything perfectly in line, on time, according to the revelation of Scripture. And so, now what we should see, <clears throat> excuse me, is that if we're at this time of the abomination of desolation and the mark of the beast and it's time for them to flee, look at what it says in verse 19. Mark 13, verse 19. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. So remember when I said back here in verse 8, that World War III and all of this is just the beginnings of sorrows? That's because at the time of the mark of the beast, when he gets his power to continue, 
verse 19 tells us it's going to be a time such as never was since the creation. Remember when I said you can't, we can't really wrap our mind around what that means? I don't see how we can. This means it would be worse than, than anything that ever existed before at mid-seals when the beast gets his power to continue 42 months. If World War III is hard to fathom, and it literally being every nation it says this time, and that's only called the beginning, then what will be this point? I couldn't even fathom. It's going to be an attack on Christians worse than any slaughter of going after people in human history ever was. Because it's going to be the greatest revival in human history and more people coming to Christ. Over a billion people. I believe 1.2 something billion people. How many will die till the end of the sixth year of seals? I don't know. Uh, I think the majority will survive. But maybe even two, three, four hundred million people as Christians will have been killed for their faith in this time. In a three and a half year period. Try to wrap your head around that. Let alone how many people will have died from World War III, famines and hunger and starvation and, and, and uh, uh, um, uh, thirst and everything else. We cannot wrap our minds around it. That's why what the Lord is going to give to that remnant worker group is going to have to be so powerful to, to endure and to seek him in it and be so indwelled with the Holy Ghost at Acts 2.0 to 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 be able to endure everything that's coming that's why their reward is with the lord for the works that they're going to do because they're going to be sacrificing doing the things he did for them it's wild then listen to what it says now in mark 13 22 look at what we get for false christs and false prophets shall rise and they shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Huh. But take ye heed. Behold, I have foretold you all things. Remember. You've been told ahead of time. Don't be seduced by these things. Suddenly, in the second half of Mark's discourse, at the time of the abomination of desolation, the mark of the beast in the flesh, which is the temple, suddenly the false Christ and false prophets show up. Exactly, because that's where they are in the second half of seals, in the last three and a half years of the first six years of tribulation. Until what? Until, you guessed it, the coming of the Son of Man. Do you think this is going to be the same one as Luke's? Nope. Won't be the same one as Matthew's either. Look at what Mark says. But in those days, after that tribulation, pretty wild, right? After that tribulation. Do you know why this is awesome? We see this, I think it's in 2 uh, Baruch. In 2 Baruch, um, I think it's this part right here. Right here. So in 2 Baruch, I think it's chap I think this would represent chapter 32 verse 6. For when the mighty one renews his creation, there will be a trial greater, listen to this, than these two tribulations. Hello. Greater than these two tribulations. Why than these two tribulations? Because this Marks is the portion of seals. It is the portion for the world and the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in. So listen to what it says. But in those days, uh, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. So what? And the stars of heaven shall fall. Well, let's go to the book of Revelation again. And let's go to Revelation chapter 6 <clears throat> and see this coming of the Son of Man at the end of the sixth year of seals. Is it possible? 
Huh, look what it says. Let's start. There's the sixth seal. Let's go to, oh, let's just start in the sixth seal, uh, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun was blackened as sackcloth of hair, of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Then what do we see happen? The rich men of the earth, the, the great men, the captains, the mighty, every bondman, every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, right? Do you think, do you think it's, a, it's a mystery why all of these elites and all of these super wealthy are building bunkers and hideouts all over the world? Hello. This, here they are right here. Here they are. And it says, and said unto the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is coming. Sound familiar? Darn right it sounds familiar. Do you know where the Lord is here? He's not coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. He's not coming on the Mount of Olives. In fact, the answer we're given is in Daniel chapter 12. I mean, Daniel chapter 2 as well. In Daniel chapter 2, we saw the image of the beast, right? This time that will be in the latter days. We know this great image, which is all about the image of the beast. Remember, they're going to worship the image of the beast. And here he is. We've got all the description of it and the ten toes. And then what do we see? It says in verse in Daniel 2, verse 34, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smot the image upon the feet that was of iron and clay and break them in pieces. And the iron, clay, brass, silver, gold were broken in pieces together and became as chaff of the summer threshing floor. You see? Because when the th Lord comes, what? It's the threshing of wheat, right? That, that final crushing of all of it. And what was it? It says, and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain. This is the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals on heavenly Mount Zion, the place prepared. We see this in the Apocrypha of 2 Esdras. We've talked about it many times. And it says, uh, da, 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 da. we'll go to verse 33. I think it's chapter 13, verse 33. And when all nations hear his voice, every man shall leave his own land and the warfare they had against one another and an innumerable multitude will be gathered together, as you saw, desiring uh, to come and conquer him. But he shall stand on top of Mount Zion. He's going to be standing on Mount Zion, not on the Mount of Olives. He's coming with heavenly Mount Zion, the stone carved without hand that becomes a great mountain. Look at what it says. And Zion will come to be made manifest to all people, prepared and built, as you saw, a mountain carved without hands. This is the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. This is, this is the coming of the Son of Man that we're reading about in Mark chapter 13. And what does he do? He destroys all of those who came against him. All of these that were coming to conquer him. Who are they? They're the ten toes. They're the ten horns of the beast of Revelation 17. It's the first battle of the Lord. It's the Ezekiel 39 war. And here he is on Mount Zion, which is paradise that he's come with the place prepared to receive them. And then what does it say in verse 39? And as for you, seeing him gather to himself another multitude that was peaceable, these are the ten tribes. Hello. Ten tribes are the house of Israel, and the Gentiles are who? The Gentiles are the ones grafted in with them. It's all there for us. It's all there. Let's go back to Mark chapter 13. When is this going to happen? When is the Lord going to be seen coming at the end of the sixth year of seals? 
Do you not think this is going to freak everybody out? Do you understand why they're crawling in the caves and in the rocks and mountains and saying, fall on us, hide us, ah! After everything we just talked about with World War III just being the beginning, and and then when the beast gets his power to continue for 42 months, and everybody's fleeing, and it's called a time worse than it was in all of human history, to that point, could you imagine what the world is going to see coming when the Son of Man is coming on heavenly Mount Zion? I, I It's going to look like some sort of mountain? I don't know. But apparently, is it like some sort of ship-looking mountain? I, I, I have no idea. But he's coming with it, having prepared it, so that when he takes the great multitude rapture, which is those going to paradise, they will go to the place he prepared for them. Look at what it says. Um, back in Mark 13, 26, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in, there's that word in again, but look at this. It's clouds, plural. Which this alone should say, wait a second. That's outside of these other things that we saw from Luke. This is obviously a different, a, a different understanding of him coming. Let alone the rest of what we just read was different than what he said in Luke. How he's coming now being in clouds, plural. This is him coming in the clouds on heavenly Mount Zion. Awesome stuff. Now, here's the other question. Well, when is it? When is the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion? Well, lo and behold, look what it says. But of that day and hour knows no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. What is the day and hour no one knows? It's the Feast of Trumpets. So the Feast of Trumpets, six years later from when the tribulation began, would be Feast of Trumpets right here, Feast of Trumpets 2030, which means Feast of Trumpets 2030 would be the 28th to the 29th of September in the year 2030. But did you notice something? In Revelation chapter 6, they saw him coming. So months before, I don't think so. Weeks before, I don't think so. Maybe a short period, a few days, a couple days, maybe just a day before is the actual event of what we saw in Daniel chapter 2 when he destroys the image of the beast and everything. That's when, that's when the beast is killed. So he was... And then we saw in 17, he is not because he's killed. So the whole world is seeing him coming right at the tail end of the sixth year. And then on the day and hour, no one knows that's the beginning of the seventh year. So what we're reading here is if we go to Mark chapter nine, which you can again go watch and tie it in to that video that reveals before the tribulation and you'll notice mark only has one verse before his transfiguration story <laughs> and his verse is a past tense wording it says uh that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of god come with power they're going to see the kingdom of God come with power. They didn't get to go, but they will have seen it before. Well, what's the end of the sixth year of seals? When he's destroying all the enemies. When he destroyed the image of the beast and the ten toes, and <clears throat> and it came crumbling down, and the beast in the Ezekiel 39 war is now thrown into the pit. Hello. And then look at what you see. After six days is what? After six years, prophetically, days for years, which means what? The day and hour no one knows. It started on the day and hour no one knows at the start of the 14 years. After six years, the seventh year starts on the day and hour no one knows. Which means when we get to this point, we should be at the point 
where the division between father and son, mother and daughter, and the story of, of Elijah and the, the John the Baptist Elijah type, and the Moses type for that matter, should be now coming to an end. And that's exactly what happens in Mark's transfiguration story. In verse 11, he says, And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elijah must come first? And he answered and told them, Elijah verily cometh first and restores all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. But I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come. And they have done unto him whatsoever they wished. You see, he did come and restore all things. This is the end of six years of seals. So he has restored all things. Which means at the end of Mark's discourse, Elijah had already been here, that John the Baptist type, that Elijah remnant group of workers were here during seals and restored all things, the father to son, the mother to daughter, just as he said it would happen in Malachi. And just as Jesus said in chapter 12, when he brought the vision, and we know that it's this future Elijah type and this remnant worker group as Elijah's who are going to restore father and son, mother and daughter. See how awesome that is? But what else is it? Well, at the end of seals, it's a picture now of them with Moses. Remember everybody in Mark chapter 13 when they now fled into the wilderness because of the time of the mark of the beast, which was in the flesh, which was like Moses' portable flesh-covered temple? Well, when that time comes to an end and they were about to cross over to the promised land, Moses couldn't go over, but then who showed up? Who was it? Joshua, right? The two spies, Joshua being one of them. And Joshua's name is Yeshua. And he was the one that took them over into the promised land as high priest and king. That's a picture of Jesus at the end of the sixth year of seals who will then cross them over into the promised land, which is the great multitude rapture of those going to paradise. You see how beautiful this is? You see how absolutely extraordinarily awesome all of this is? Now you can see why Marx talks about the day and hour no one knows. And you can understand that in the day and hour of no one knows in Marx, it doesn't talk about Mo it doesn't talk about the days of Noah either. When you go into Revelation chapter seven, you then see that when he starts the seventh year on the day and hour no one knows after six, we now see the first thing to happen is the 144,000 get sealed. After the 144,000 get sealed, look what happens. The great multitude no man can number coming in, which will be all those left alive as well as those who had died during the time of seals for Christ. <clears throat> a total of over 1.2 billion in my understanding of, of what's been revealed. When? In the midst of the seventh year of seals, which, of course, we've also revealed in the different harvest models, that if the Lord is coming and is here at the end of September 2030, feet down on the Mount of All, uh, uh, sorry, um, on Heavenly Mount Zion, they saw him come. And then there he is on heavenly Mount Zion. <clears throat> the 144,000 are sealed first. The great multitude rapture, the assembly, the gathering is taking place because this is the time of spring wheat harvest. But the spring wheat isn't ready to be observed or used. Remember, there's bearing of the bones for seven months, which means they don't come in till at least first Passover. Uh, uh, yeah, Passover, but they will most likely, which is seven months later, come in at second Passover on the second day, this time of second Passover of 2031. This is when the, the spring wheat, which is new wheat harvested in the fall, is now called old and can be used. That's why we see the 144 being sealed and there with the Lord first before the great multitude. Because the 144,000 help 
the great multitude come in, they help the remaining servants that were there during seals. They're going to help them bring in this great multitude rapture. But the Lord's coming is, as Mark 13 said, going to happen on the day and hour no one knows. They will see him come before, just shortly before. But his coming and his establishment to begin the seventh year on heavenly Mount Zion, paradise, the place prepared where the great multitude rapture will be going, will be him having come after that tribulation on the day and hour no one knows. Awesome stuff, guys. Now what happens when we go into Matthew? Now we go into Matthew chapter 24. Hopefully I can go a little bit faster, but there's so many great details. So now we come into Matthew's and listen to what Matthew says. Uh, in verse 3, in Matthew 24, and he, and he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? Which is this word coming in all of the Gospels is only used four times. All four are used in Matthew chapter 24. So when you realize Luke and Mark are speaking to different groups and Matthew is speaking to the house of Judah and speaking about the end of days, this coming is talking about the Lord's return, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and we'll show it to you by where it's talked about. And then it says what? End of the end of the world. <clears throat> you see? Because there is no end of the world spoken about in Luke's, no end of the world spoken about in Mark's, because it's not yet the end of the world. You see, only in Matthew chapter 28 do we see another picture of the Lord having returned at the seventh trumpet, at the 14th year. He will come at the start of the 14th year to fulfill it in the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance, when he says all power is given unto him in heaven and in earth. And then he has the a group that will work during, tr during uh, the millennial reign, which are the 12 tribes. And it says, go ye and teach all nations. You see, no more preaching because the whole world will know that he's here. And then it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This is the millennial reign. And then it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Why? Because at that point, when he returns feet down, he is here till the end of the millennial reign. And that's why they're asking him. When is the time of your coming, returning feet down on the Mount of Olives, and your being here until the end of the world? So now we keep going. We see even uh, delivering up. So if we go to verse uh, 9, remember the nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This is the same start as Mark's. Remember, it starts in Jerusalem, right? It starts at Judah. We come into verse uh, 9. Of Matthew 24 then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another you notice it's not the same as Mark's and Luke's was it there's no father against son mother against daughter it's that you're gonna be, be you're gonna be hated and betrayed by people out there but not the father and son, mother and daughter, because they have been uh, um, uh, reunited. They have been brought back together at the end of seals for the great multitude rapture. This is to Judah. Now listen what happens. In Matthew 24, 11, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. You see why this is so awesome? This being where it is? Because we saw in Luke, there was no false Christ or false prophets. So we know they're not coming officially to power during the above portion. In Mark's discourse, in the first two and a half years during World War III, there is no false Christ or false prophets mentioned. Then you have the abomination and you got false Christ and false prophets being mentioned. 
But at the end of the sixth year of seals, the ten kings come against them. They're destroyed, and so is the beast. And so he's the, the uh, uh, Revelation 17 was, and then after the 42 months, because he's killed at the end of the six year seals, he now is not. But who wasn't killed? The false prophet. So here we are in the first half of trumpets, of the seven years of trumpet judgments now having started. The Lord is here on heavenly Mount Zion. The 144,000 are being have been sent out and the city and the streets and what's happening now. Now the temple is being rebuilt. You see, in the midst of seals, only the foundation was laid. But now that the Lord has returned, he's going to now oversee with Zerubbabel. Jesus is going to be the high priest and king. And Zerubbabel is going to be the one overseeing the rebuilding of the temple on the foundation that he had laid in the midst of seals. You see, we've all been taught that it's the beast who's going to build the temple. Well, at no point in human history of any temple that's ever been built for the Lord has it ever been the enemy who has built it. The Lord will now be here. Remember, it's the Lord who brings them over into the promised land. Moses dies. Elijah has completed his work and the Lord shows up and takes them over into the promised land. Now the Lord is there. He's high priest and king like Joshua, Yeshua, the high priest and king, the Melchizedek. He's now there. He's on the right side of the father, seated on the right side of the father. And the temple now starts to get rebuilt <coughs> in this first half of trumpets, the first three and a half years, which is why. We've got videos and teachings on Daniel as well, which is why, though, when you come to Daniel chapter 9 and you go to 25, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, which means it was destroyed. And it was destroyed at the beginning of the 14 years. So there's going to be a commandment to allow them to go back and rebuild, but the only thing that will get rebuilt in the first seven years is the foundation. So he says, look, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks. Weeks of what? Weeks of years, seven years. Seven years will pass before the rebuilding starts. And then you have comma end, which means in addition to, separate and addition, which means over the next about three and a half years, it says the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And we know the temple will as well, according to Zechariah. Zechariah, for those that hadn't seen this, 14 chapters, 14 years. The beginning of Trump, uh, the beginning of the seven years of trumpets begins in Zechariah chapter eight. And look at where the Lord is. He's on Mount Zion called the mountain of the Lord. And then he tells them to let your hands be strong. Let your hands be strong. You that hear in these days, these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid, which in Zechariah happened in chapter four, which would be in the fourth year of seals. So in the midst of chaos, the foundation will be laid in Jerusalem, but that's all that will get accomplished in the midst of the chaos. Now, the Lord is there on Mount Zion. He's high priest and king. Zerubbabel, who laid the foundation, we are told he is going to be the one to finish it, right? To oversee that finishing of it. And what does it say? The foundation that had been laid so that what? The temple can now be built. Why couldn't they do it before? For before these days, there was no man for hire, nor, uh, uh, for hire, nor any beast. Neither was there any peace, remember? Because peace was taken at the red horse rider at the destruction of Jerusalem when the 14 years began. Because there was no peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set everyone against his neighbor. Hello. Peace was removed and he set everyone against his neighbor. Red horse rider. Now, the eighth year of tribulation, the first year of trumpet judgments has started. And the temple is about to be laid. And according to Daniel 9, 
this rebuilding of everything will last about three and a half years, which puts us to mid-trumpet judgments, okay? Mid-trumpets. When the three and a half years approximately are done, listen to what it says. And after the about three and a half years, you see two weeks, weeks of years, 60, if you count them as actual weeks, it'd be about three years and two months. So about three and a half years. Listen to this. Shall Messiah be cut off? You see, everybody reads this as only being taken place in the is when Christ came the first time. They always read it as being multiples of weeks times 77 times 7. It is also prophetically laid out in simply one week being one year. It's 14 years right here in it. Seven, about three and a half, two and a half with the flood and the war in the second half of trumpets. And then the final year when he confirms the covenant, which is the Lord confirming the covenant with many when he returns feet down. Seven, three and a half, two and a half, one, 14 years. So look at what it says. When you understand that it's Messiah here from the end of the sixth year of seals, and now the seven years of trumpet judgments begin, and the city and streets are being rebuilt, the 144 are going out evangelizing, the following the Lord and the Lord with them. He is here as, as Melchizedek, high priest and king, the, the Messiah, Ben Joseph, or Ephraim. He's now got three and a half years while Zerubbabel and them are rebuilding everything. And then what does it say? Then Messiah is going to be cut off. Why is he cut off? That brings you to the middle of trumpet judgments. And it says, because the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war, which means there's a war after this time that lasts a certain amount of time because it's to the end of it, desolations are determined. Which means seven, about three and a half, at about ten and a half years into the total of tribulation, this cutoff of Messiah takes place after the rebuilding of the temple had been finished. So when we go into Matthew, and we go into Matthew chapter 24, we understood from Revelation 17 that the false prophet is still there because he wasn't killed, but the false Christ He's not there because he was killed at the end of the six year seals. His 42 months of the was is over. And then you've got the 1260 days, which is the period of the first half of trumpets, while Satan and his angels are fighting against Michael and his angels in the heavens. While the two witnesses are doing their work in the first half of trumpets until the cutoff. And so now the false Christ isn't there. And in the first half of Matthew's discourse, only false prophets there, not false Christs. And listen to what it says. We'll continue Matthew 24, 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Listen to this. And then shall the end come. <laughs> Remember, and then shall the end come. Okay, the, his end, not the end of the world, but then the end of tribulation will come. Because there is still preaching in the midst of trumpet judgments. Because remember when the Lord came in Mark's discourse at the end of seals, he came on heavenly Mount Zion in the clouds. They're not all going to have seen Christ coming as lightning, knowing that it's fully the Lord, that he's that he's fully ruling and reigning for a thousand years. The whole world hasn't seen him at this point. They're seeing something and they're freaking out by it. But we can still see their events taking place. He is not coming as king of kings and lord of lords, all uppercase at the end of seals. That's at the end of trumpets, at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. So now, during this first half of trumpet judgments, this is when the city and the streets and the temple are being rebuilt. While the, the force four trumpets are falling and bringing devastation to a third or so of the earth. 
Now look what happens. Now we're at Matthew 24, verse 15, and we have another abomination of desolation. But what do we know has happened? We know that the temple has just been rebuilt during the first half of trumpet judgments. Zerubbabel was rebuilding it. Messiah, as high priest and king, was there overseeing the 144. So now what happens? According to Daniel, this abomination of desolation was the people of the prince that come. Well, who's the prince that's coming? The was that then is not because for the first half of trumpets, he is not because he's in the pit. And then what? Shall ascend out of the pit and go into perdition. When he goes into perdition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which is now mid trumpets, about 10 and a half years into tribulation, what does he do? Listen to what it says 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God. You see? He's going to then be sitting in the temple. The world will tell you either there's going to be a temple or that the mark of the beast is the temple, and they don't know how to reconcile both together. That's because they're separate. When the son of perdition comes out of the pit, he was, is not because he was killed at the end of seals, then ascends out of the bottomless pit, like Revelation 17 says, and now is the son of perdition. Well, the temple has now been rebuilt. On the foundation that was laid during seals, the temple is rebuilt. We're now 10 and a half years into tribulation, which would mean we're in the 11th year. And guess what? You guys love this one. Second Kings chapter six, the last two verses. Whoops. First Kings chapter six. The last two verses. Verse 37, 38. In the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid. Huh? Zechariah chapter four, 14 chapters in the fourth year was the foundation laid by Zerubbabel. And it said his hands would be the plummet would be in his hands and he would be the one to finish the temple and then look what it says in the 11th year which is what about 10 and a half years in the 11th year in the month of bull which is the eighth month was the house finished it took seven years total from the midst of seals to the midst of trumpets in the 11th year 10 and a half years now the temple has been rebuilt so when he comes out of the pit at the fifth trumpet, which is at the first woe, what is he going to do? This abomination of desolation is the one where he stands in the holy place. This is him now standing in the holy place as the son of perdition. And what happens? Well, Messiah and everybody's cut off. Here's the time of fleeing into the mountains again. Do you know what fleeing this is? This is the fleeing of Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, which is what? At the first woe, when Satan lost his battle and is cast down to the earth, the pit is opened, the beast comes out of the pit, he is now the son of perdition, and he goes after them, and look what it says. Revelation 12, 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly away into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time, comma, and times, comma, and half a time. One plus two plus a half. Altogether, three and a half years. So from ten and a half years, three and a half more years would be to the end of the 14 years. But what did he do? He went after her with a flood, right? Remember? Verse 15. And the serpent cast out out of his mouth water as a flood to go after her. Well, wait a second. Daniel chapter 9 told us the same thing. At the point when Messiah is cut off, 
which is after the temple is built, it's about three and a half years into trumpet judgments for a total of about ten and a half years when he's cut off. It says, then the prince shall come and shall destroy the city in the, in the sanctuary. And listen to this. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. They're going after her with a flood, but then she flies away on the wings of an eagle for the final three and a half years. Because it's what? It's the abomination of desolation in Matthew's gospel, in his discourse, when he's going to be the son of perdition standing in the temple, the completed temple. So now they have fled, and war breaks out against the two witnesses. Well, wait a second. Now we know there's three and a half years left. It starts with cutting them off, a flood to go after her, but she flies away for the last three and a half years, and then there's a war. Because it says, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So if there's one more week of year here, and it was ten and a half to this point, then that means from this cutoff to the end of verse 26 is only two and a half of the final three and a half years. And that's why in, Revelation, in Daniel chapter 12, that's exactly what we read. In chapter 12, verse 7, it says, you know, how long, right, that, that this one, the, this craziness that's happening. It says, um, and swear by him that liveth forever, halfway through verse 7 of Daniel 12, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. There's no end between time and times, which means one, two, plus a half, two and a half years of the final three and a half years. So this means the enemy is getting two and a half of the final three and a half years when Satan's cast down, the pit is open, Messiah's cut off, they fly away on the wings of an eagle, and they're, they're safe until the end of the 14th year, but Satan's time, these guys have two and a half of the final three and a half years. It says, when he shall have accomplished to scatter <coughs> the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So if everything is finished, of, of the enemy being able to have his way at mid-trumpet's point when he goes into the temple proclaiming himself to be God as the son of perdition. He has two and a half years before it's finished. What is the finished? That's what we talked about briefly at the beginning in, in passing when I was talking about this. In Revelation chapter 10, we see it right here in verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seven angel when he shall begin to sound. As soon as that seventh angel sounds, the mystery of God should be finished. As he had declared it to his servants, the prophets, it'll be finished at the beginning of the seventh trumpet, which is the start of the 14th year. When? When immediately after the tribulation is over and the Lord has then returned, feet down on the Mount of Olives. It's the beginning of the sounding of the seventh year, that seventh trumpet. It'll be finished. And this is the part in 1 Corinthians 15 that so many people mix up. You see, when people don't understand the differences in the Gospels and the timing, anything that looks like a taking away, it, they all think it means pre-trip. But it doesn't. Listen to what it says. This is the one everybody talks about. Um, let's start in, in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, let's just go 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. <laughs> not at the beginning of opening a seal. At the last trump, which is a trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, which is the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That are those who were in Christ that remained until the end will be changed. Who are the ones who are being raised from the dead? And the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Who are these people being raised? Well, it's just like Matthew in Christ when he was crucified in mark in luke we don't see it in mark we don't see it it's only in matthew that we see it we just recently spoke about it where at the crucifixion 
And then we know it's, it's his crucifixion and he resurrects, right? And what ended up happening? In Matthew 27, 51 through 53, we only see it here. Because it's prophetically telling us by only being in Matthew when this resurrection at the seventh trumpet will take place. Who are part of those people in the resurrection? The ones who put their, their life on the line starting in Luke that remained to serve the Lord and will be resurrected to rule and reign with them. This is the prophetic typology we're seeing in this in the is to come. Matthew 27, 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent, was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. Who gets to take part in the first resurrection? <laughs> you see, is not this the first resurrection? And so what is it prophetically in the end? Those who will take part in the first resurrection, Revelation chapter 20, that will not be hurt by the second death. It's the Smyrna. It's the remnant group of workers from Luke. Man, is it ever awesome. So as we go back now into Matthew 24, as it's trying to work its way back, I think it doesn't like all my highlights. Come on, come on, come on. There we go. Matthew chapter 24. Here's that abomination of desolation. Now again, back in the middle of the seven, uh, the ten and a half years or the th three and a half years into trumpet judgments, they fled away on the wings of an eagle. The, the, the pit is opened at the fifth trumpet. And to make a point in this, remember this war that Daniel spoke about. So not only did he go after the flood, which we covered, but then it said until the end of the war, which means when... The coming into the holy place because of the abomination of desolation, which is when the pit is open and he comes back as the son of perdition. Not only does Satan go after them with a flood, but the beast who has come back, who now it shall be, is now there. Listen to what it says. We know that it's until the end of the war, right? Well, that war is the war that breaks out against the two witnesses after the 1260 days are done you following look at this treading underfoot this is the treading underfoot that jesus said would happen during seals this is the during the 42 months of the beast so you've got 42 months you've got 1260 the 1260 is the first half of trumpets while the two witnesses are witness are doing their work who are by the way i'm not going to go into it but the two witnesses you see them in in zachariah we know who they are and who they represent. But what happens when their 1260 days are over? When their 1260 days are over, what happens? Verse 11, Revelation 11, sorry, Revelation 11, verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, hello. There it is. Now he's coming out of the bottomless pit. Shall make war against them. There's your war. We saw the flood. Now this is the war that Daniel 9, 25 or 26 said that unto the end of the war, which means the war begins at mid trumpets when Messiah is cut off and it's going to last for how long? Out of the final three and a half years, Daniel told us in 12 that it'll last two and a half years. So this war against the two witnesses when he will overcome them and then kill them is going to last two and a half years which is why at the seventh trumpet it's the lord returning feet down the resurrection of the dead them being those being alive in the lord being changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye being immediately after the tribulation of those days as we'll see being at the sound of the seventh trumpet it is the final 14th year. It is Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, that brings us to that final 14th year when the Lord will then bring justice against these enemies. But this war portion lasted for two and a half of the final three and a half years. 
So when we go back to Matthew 24, as we start wrapping this up, we can now see that this abomination of desolation, mid-trumpets, goes after them with the flood. They're taken away for the final three and a half years to the end of the 14 years. And there's a war that breaks out against the two witnesses. And it's going to last for two and a half years until the end of the sixth trumpet, which is the second woe. So from the fifth trumpet, the start of the fifth trumpet to the end of the sixth trumpet is two and a half years. Revelation 12 said because Satan knew he only has a little time. That little time is two and a half years with the beast and the false prophet, which means if this is now the abomination of desolation of, of him coming out of the pit, then when we had just the false prophet here, we should now see false prophets and false Christ again. Well, look what comes next. Okay, let's go to, let's start in verse 21. Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world unto this time. Now listen to this. No, nor ever shall be. So remember how bad it was when I was talking about it in Mark, that how bad it would be at the midpoint of seals or middish at about two and a half years in after World War III, as unimaginably bad as that's going to be, when the beast got his power for 42 months, it would be worse than at any point in creation unto that point. This is now mid-trumpets. And at this point, Satan has been cast down to the earth with his fallen angels. The, the pit, I mean, with his angels. And the pit has been opened and the beast has come back in all of those with the beast <laughs> oh my goodness guys we cannot fathom what this will look like at the mid trumpets point we can't even we can't even come close it's hard to even understand what world war 3 will be like let alone the second half of seals let alone the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion for the great multitude rapture. Let alone when Satan is cast down and all three of them are here and all of their goons with them. It's, it's insanity to even consider. And then let's go down a little further. Let's go to verse 24 and listen to what it says. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets. The false Christ is back. He wasn't here over in the first half of Trumpets because he, World War Three. then he was, then he is not, and then <clears throat> shall be when he comes out of the pit. See how awesome that is to understand? See how absolutely incredible it is to understand? <clears throat> Which means what comes next? We know that they have two and a half years. They have two and a half years to wreak havoc. This war against the two witnesses. Till the end of the sixth trumpet. To the end of the sixth year of trumpet judgments. Which is to the end of 13 years total tribulation. Which leaves the final year. Which is Daniel 9.27. You see, the Lord makes a covenant with all people at the end of this, at the end of seals. At mid trumpets, he has to break the covenant that he made with all people. We read about that in Zechariah 11. That's why in Daniel 9, 27, he's renewing it. He's renewing the covenant that he had to break because of these three. When Satan was cast down, the pit was open and the false prophet was there with them too. So when those two and a half years are over, which would be immediately after the tribulation of those days, as soon as the seventh trumpet sounds, what do you think they're going to see? For as lightning that lighteth out of the east and shineth unto the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Remember they said what would his coming be? We know even from Luke 17 that his coming will be as lightning from one side, one end to the other. So what does it say about this? 
where all the carcasses of the eagles would be gathered? Of course. It's Revelation 19. When he comes for the treading of the winepress of the grapes of wrath. And what happens in Revelation 19 at the treading of the grapes of wrath? This this final 14th year of his coming is is the is the year is sorry is the day of the Lord which is the year of his vengeance. It is the treading of the grapes of wrath which is his second sword, his vestiture dipped in blood and look what happens. The wrath of almighty God it's the second battle, just like Zechariah chapter 14 says. It says, then shall the Lord go and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. That's because the as when he fought in the day of battle is at the end of seals, the end of the six year of seals. This is now the one that he's fighting at the start of the 14th year of trumpets. And look at what it says in verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken with them and with them, the false prophet that, as we said earlier, that brought miracles before him with which he deceived them that he received the mark of the beast and then that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Now. They're cast into the lake of fire. They're finished. They're there forever in eternity now. You see, they're the first two taken into the lake of fire. <clears throat> At the coming of the Lord in Matthew chapter 24, which is immediately after the tribulation of those days, when he comes as lightning from one end unto the other, as he said he would at his coming. And then all of the carcasses for it. Now listen to what it says. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Isn't that incredible wording? Isn't that absolutely incredible wording? When, when we just read what Marx was saying. After the tribulation of those days. And now we have immediately after the tribulation of those days. Oh, no, no. Marx was after that tribulation. And we saw how in the, the Apocrypha of 2nd Baruch, there were two tribulations. So now listen to what happens. This is the Lord returning, feet down on the Mount of Olives, like Zechariah 14, like Revelation 19. He's coming now as lightning from one end unto the other, where the whole world will see him. And it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in. Remember Luke said in? Mark said in? Luke was in a cloud. Mark was in the clouds, plural. Look at what Matthew's word for in is. It's the word on. And he's coming on. On the clouds, plural, of heaven, with power and great glory. And look at what it says next. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. You see? The last trumpet, as soon as the seventh trumpet sounds, the mystery is over. Satan's two and a half years, and that two and a half years is over. It's the final trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven unto another. And when do you think it should be? Do you think maybe it should be like Luke 24, 36 says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the fa uh, uh, not the angels, but the father only. Do you understand why now? Because if we go back to the chart, the end of the sixth year, which is the end of 13 years, the 14th year begins at what? The day and hour no one knows. It started on the day and hour no one knows. Six years ended and the seventh year started on the day and hour no one knows. The eighth year 
or the first year of trumpet judgments started on the day and hour no one knows. The six years end and this 14th year starts on the day and hour no one knows. Which is what? When he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. You'll remember from the transfiguration story that the reason Matthew's gospel is laid out the way it is and there's no writing before the transfiguration is because they will not have seen him come first. It's because as soon as the seventh trumpet, which is after six days or six years as days to years in the prophetic, is the start of the seventh year of trumpets, and they will not have seen him coming slightly beforehand like they did at the end of the sixth year of seals. It'll suddenly be him coming on the clouds as lightning from one end unto the other after six days or six years, which is the start of the seventh year of trumpets, which would be the start of the seventh year or the 14th year of tribulation on the day and hour no one knows. And look what it follows up with. Okay, this is the end now of 13 years. He's destroyed them. It's he's or he's in a battle against them in that in that 14th year, which is the Isaiah. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Isaiah 61. Right. The the day of the Lord, which is the year of his wrath. It's the treading of the grapes. It's the Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah 25 says what? When 70 years are over, this is the 70 years of Jerusalem from capturing Jerusalem. We have a 70 that comes to an end from, from uh, uh, Leviticus of when they came into the land. But then we've got a 70 of when they captured all of Jerusalem. And that ends from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets for the house of Judah. That ends at Feast of Trumpets or the day before Feast of Trumpets 2037 at the end of 13 years. And Jeremiah 25 says when the 70 years are accomplished, He's going to gather all the enemies, get them to drink, and tread them like grapes in his wrath, which is the final 14th year. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that wild? Do you know what happens at that end of 13 years? Do you know why it's 13 years and then the 14th year? We've talked about this in the past. It's the story of a wedding. Do you guys realize that? There's the Gentile bride in the beginning, but there's the Jewish bride at the end. That's why Luke, as we've shared, has a wedding story, the pre-trib Gentile bride, and Matthew has a wedding story in it as well. Mark didn't, but Matthew did. And what do you think we see when we're going to get into Matthew 25, the story about the wedding with the bridesmaids? But just like Jesus' mother Mary, they believe she was 12 to 14 years old. I can tell you right now, Revelation prophecy has revealed that she was 13 years old. Because guess what? 13 years to the coming of the Lord on the day and hour no one knows, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Do you know that's the story of the wedding? So what happened? You get married, right? So she gets married at 13. And when an ancient, in ancient Israel, when the Jewish girl would get married at 13, they would have a, that, I can't remember, is it the, uh, um, uh, the ketubah? And, and, you know, they, they have a, a, a ceremony. But, so the, they're legally married, right? They're legally married. But he has to go and prepare a place for a year. Well, that's what's going on. The Lord is come to the earth. The, the 13th year is over. He has the ceremony, if you will, where he's now legally bound to his bride. And then what is he doing? He's coming to the earth. And he's going to what? Prepare the earth for his Jewish bride. One year to prepare the earth. And so what is he doing in this final year? And what happens at the end of the year? Well, 
let's finish up this final 14th year. It starts on the day and hour no one knows. And it's what? It tells you that it would be as the days of Noah were, so will be, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So when he comes as lightning from one end to the other at the time of his coming, which I told you there's three times, there's the fourth time, only found in Matthew 24 in all of the Gospels, which means when he comes as lightning from one end to the other to begin the 14th year, he says it would be as the days of Noah. So in this final 14th year, what you will recognize is that it's also the final seven, 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 seven. This is the 49th year of the Shemitah cycles of the Jubilee count of seven times seven years. This 14th year is the final seven of the four, seven sevens of years. Do you know what happens only in a 49th year Jubilee cycle of Shemitahs? Only in this final 49th year is it a year that is counted one year and 10 days long. And the reason for the additional 10 days is because on the 10th day, you sound the jubilee, the shofar sound of the jubilee to bring restoration to all the tribes to return back their lands and everything. Well, if we're now at the final year, the 14th year, the Lord has returned, feet down on the Mount of Olives, to fulfill that final 14th year, destroying all of the enemies. Well, let's see what it tells us about this. At the coming of the Son of Man, at the end of 13, to start that 14th year, it said it would be as in the days of Noah. Guess what? We should probably go look to understand the timing of Noah. Not that we're looking at the dates for Noah. We're looking at the counts. And look at what it said about Noah. It said it was the second month, 17th day when it began. All right? When we go to chapter 8, it tells us it was <clears throat> in Genesis 8, 14, and in the second month, on the 27th day. Did you catch that? It just said that <clears throat> the final year represented as the days of Noah year was one year and 10 days long. One year and 10 days long. And only in the 49th year are we looking for a year and 10 days long? And in the revelation of the Gospels in order, tracking from Luke to Mark to Matthew, we're coming to the coming of the Lord, returning feet down on the Mount of Olives at the start of the 14th year, at the seventh trumpet. At the time, we're told it's the day and hour no one knows, which is the Feast of Trumpets, and that it would last for one year and 10 days because he tells us it would be as it was in the days of Noah. Are you kidding me? Do you know why this is a big deal? Let me show you. The rest of it talks more about the, the workers that we're not talking about so much tonight. Listen to this. When we go to Leviticus chapter 25, listen to what it says when you count what? Seven times seven years. Just like we just displayed. You'll have 49 years. So we're talking about the final 49th year. Listen to what it says. Then shall thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month in the Day of Atonement. You know why that's so valuable? Why this is such a big deal and so important to us, brothers and sisters? Because this final 49th year, the days of Noah, we know is one year and 10 days long. 
and it starts all the way from Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Trumpets. It starts at the Feast of Trumpets. One year and ten days long would mean from the Feast of Trumpets, 2037, which would be September 10th to the 11th of 2037, the 14th year begins. It will be as it was in the days of Noah. It will last for one year to the third, from the 30th of September to the 1st of October, 2038, for which we are then told when that final 49th year, which is the 14th year, is over, there are 10 days to Yom Kippur, which is precisely when the trumpet of the Jubilee is to be sounded. What? What happens? Then it's liberty. And they'll return. Every man shall return to his possession. So who are all of these people returning to their possession? Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Remember the five fragments? The fragment five? It said that the final group would receive the city <clears throat> that he was coming to them. Now, all of those that were in the wilderness from the mid trumpets, when they flew all the way on the wings of an eagle till the end of the, uh, of the 14th year, they will then hear the sound of the trumpet at, in 2038, at the end of the year and 10 days as Noah, and will return to Jerusalem to celebrate and observe the Jubilee, the beginning of the millennial reign, and the restitution of their lands, their possessions, the promise of their city, Jerusalem. This is why in Isaiah chapter 61, no, 65, we see when the Lord will renew Jerusalem will renew the earth. This is not new Jerusalem coming down in Isaiah 65 17. It says for behold, I create a new Okay, heavens this word for create uh, In the word for new look at the word for new a fresh thing, but it means repairing it Because in Ezekiel chapter 49 or 48 we saw, actually, no, 47, when we see that all the tribes are about to start getting their division of land, it starts with what? Water flowing from the temple. The Lord having returned, having defeated the enemy, and water flowing out from the temple in Jerusalem, restoring the land, restoring the land all over the earth. He's not going, it's not the new heavens and the new earth during the millennial reign. He is repairing it. He is restoring it. So that, look at this. Remember what happens? Isaiah 65, starting verse 20. Then there shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old. But the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. You see, because they will be living like what? Like they were living in the beginning of the creation of fleshly man. They will be living for hundreds and hundreds of years again. Because the Lord is going to restore the earth as he had created it for the flesh of portion which is the jews who will inherit the city which get the earth for their heaven on earth millennial reign this is what's happening at the end so you can now see and understand what this days of noah literally is in matthew's revelation it relates to the final 14th year of of tribulation that will be one year and ten days long but remember what I said about that Jewish wife that 
there, there's the, the wedding, so they're legally married. But then he goes away for a year. And then he comes back a year later. So now he's restoring the earth, right? He's repaired. He's restored the earth. And what happens in that 14th year? Well, remember, the kingdom of God is for the pre-trib and mid-trib. The kingdom of heaven is for the Jews who get the city, which is the city in their millennial reign. So when he's coming, listen to what it says. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five foolish, right? Five wise, five foolish. Um, they took oils for their vessels. We all know that story. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made. And behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Do you know the story? We've shared it in the past with the video from pastor that the father says that nobody knows except the father. It's the father that will blast the shofar on the day and hour no one knows for him to go get his bride. So one year later, they'll see the Lord coming, which is a time of Feast of Trumpets. And what do they do during this time? Well, we know it's going to be the Feast of Trumpets, right? Here comes the Lord going into the marriage. The door is going to be shut. He's coming at the, the right? He's, he's receiving them, if you will. We know he's already here, but he's receiving the, this, his, his Jewish bride. And what's the world doing during this time? Well, he's already here. He's cleaning the earth and everything else, right? Do you know what happens during the 10 days from Tishri until Yom Kippur? It's the difference of the 10 days from trumpets to trumpets. He's coming on the day and hour. No one knows even at the 14th year. And what does the world get to do? What do, what do the Jews in the world get to do at that point? It's the time of repentance. It's called the days of awe. They have 10 days of repentance and of crying out and so forth. And then what happens in the final five days from Yom Kippur to tabernacles they're building booths right they're building tabernacles and then what happens then you have the jewish wedding don't you then you have the seven day wedding for the jews when the seven days of that wedding are fulfilled because remember, when he comes and there's this celebration while they have some repentance going on, then they're building everything. It's the, ten, it's the five days for building the sukkahs and the, and the tents of celebration and all these things that will take place. Then what's going to happen? Then you got your seven-day Jewish wedding. This is the seven-day Jewish wedding. This is when he returns. He goes in. The door is shut. They're having this wedding. When the wedding is over, brothers and sisters, do you know what day it is? It's the eighth day of tabernacles called Shmini Aretz. The eighth day of assembly. Do you guys know what the eighth day of tabernacles is called? The new beginning. Shmini Aretz, the 22nd day of the month, is called the new beginning. Listen to this. The new beginning is likened to entering God's eternal rest, symbolized by the land. The rest uh, is points forward to a time when heaven and humanity are reunited in the kingdom, also known as the Messianic Age. Why? Because the eighth day is called the new beginning. What is this going to be the new beginning of, brothers and sisters? It's going to be the millennial reign beginning in the year of Jubilee, the new beginning of the restoration of the messianic age of Christ. When he then says in Luke chapter 28, 
uh, sorry, in Matthew 28, as they asked him in the beginning of Matthew 24, that he will now be with them, teaching them all things. So now he's teaching the 12 tribes that are going to go out during the thousand years to instruct and teach the people throughout the earth how to observe what the Lord has commanded them, as Zechariah 14 said, that they would now come to him every year at tabernacles to observe and to worship him and that he would be with them always until the end of the world. He is now here with them until the end of the millennial reign. <clears throat> and what do you see? To those unworthy servants, what do you see to those who didn't come to the Lord, those who were wicked, those who didn't help the poor or clothe or feed or give water? Now you understand this giving to drink, this giving to eat, this clothing coming in prisons. Because prophetically in the end of days, most people don't realize Matthew 25 is a continuation of Matthew 24. And when the door is shut and the wedding has taken place, everybody who is left outside will be left to the weeping and gnashing of teeth before the final judgment of the Lord. Oh my goodness. I, I, I say this all the time, but I love these types of teachings. I love being able to go from one gospel to the next to the next, the synoptic gospels in order, Luke, Mark, and Matthew, and reveal the clarity of the revelation before our eyes as it has been revealed over the years. So clear. I, you know, some things, you know, I could have gone on for hours longer by bringing it even into the seven churches, by bringing it into the resurrection in Luke, Mark, Matthew, by bringing it in all to the transfiguration, by all to the triumphal entry, by going into John in order, uh, in, in chapters to years, uh, uh, Genesis in chapters. I mean, we could go the whole way through. And the story does not change. It is absolutely incredible. Let me show you something. Remember how we showed, this is just a, a, a side note of something that came to my mind. Remember how it's at the about two and a half years, which means in the third year, right? So in the third year is when the Antichrist and false prophet, right? When the beast and false prophet get the power to continue for 42 months. It's in the third year. So two and a half years would be in the third year. Okay? That's when the image of the beast, right? The, the building and everything, right? Well, do you know if you go to Genesis chapter 10 and you follow it in order of 21 chapters, like John's 21 chapters, then you have chapter 8 being the beginning of the 14 years, chapter 9, these are things we've taught in the in the chapters in, in chapters to years teachings. So you have year one, year two, year three, which would be in that third year, which would be about two and a half years. Look what shows up. Babylon. Nimrod. It's the first time it shows up. It's in Genesis chapter 10, which in the chapters to years of the revelation of Genesis from verse chapter one to 21, like John 21 chapters, you have the beast picture of Babylon and Nimrod show up for the first time. The exact same time in the typology of when the beast gets his power to continue 42 months, which is in the third year, two and a half years into tribulation. Isn't it wild? These are the wacky, wild, crazy things that we could show the whole way through. Just like when we said, when that war breaks out, against the two witnesses as i close this off in the in the final uh, uh, um trumpet judgments when the 1260 are done and the war breaks out against them for tw for two and a half years we know that it's two and a half years because of daniel but we also know because at the end of the sixth trumpet 
which is the second woe, is when the two witnesses had been killed just hours before it ends. Or I guess three and a half days and maybe an hour before it ends. Then what happens? Well, at the start of the seventh trumpet, the mystery is over. It's finished. Exactly what Daniel 12 said. Exactly what Revelation 10 said. Now, when the seventh angel began to sound, here we see there were great voices in heaven saying, here it is, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. What was Matthew 28? Even in the story of his resurrection, it's the same typology going on. This picture of those who will go out and teach, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go teach all nations of my ways, of what I have commanded you, and I'm here with you until the end of the world. Brothers and sisters, it cannot be more clear. I, you, it, don't bother arguing with people over seven years. Just try to share some of the key points in the revelations. Start with the Gospels and ease them into it to let them see these differences in the discourses to then realize that if there are these differences, there must be a period of time playing out differently through them. And then you could take them to Corinthians, show them pre, mid, and post are all true. It is absolutely phenomenal. And if they don't want to listen, well, guess what? We pray they're still our brothers and sisters, and we will just keep sharing. And guess what? If you get, if you decide to print one of these, I think it would be a huge blessing. There's no money in it for us, right? It doesn't matter. Get these printed if you can. If you can't afford big ones, then print little ones. Right in an appropriate size, so it could be red enough, clear enough. It doesn't have to be this big, but what a leave behind for people, right? What everything that I've taught tonight and beyond is broken down in this chart. It's absolutely incredible. God is good. The Spirit is leading. the 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 AI. Is, is proving the timing and the events out. History and the cycles of history are flat out proving it. And in this one, it is the Lord's victory. It is the Lord that will rule by his principles and his values in this age to come. Brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you and excites you and fires you up and strengthens you as it does me every time. I love you guys. God bless you. God bless your families. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.